Welcome back to the Alienware Consortium of Analytical Authority. My name is Pretty here, joined by the masked marauder himself. <laughs> a little bit of that Dolson Gormizer action. He's the man behind the mask. He just joined me down from the cast. Gore, how was it, buddy? I mean, what a semifinal to kick it off. I don't think you could have asked for anything more yeah, than man. that. I mean, you get seven games, a lot of them close. The only one that wasn't close was Bright Marsh, but even then you get a beautiful set of gameplay from the Knights. You get a game 7.7 7 on Frog Isle, which is Dave's favorite map, so I'm sure he enjoyed that more than anything. It was pretty much everything you could have asked for. Incredible action from our first semifinal of the day, but it's just about time to get into the second semifinal of the day. We've had two heavyweight teams going at it in the first one of the day, but we've got two more up for you. It's the hottest team with the longest win streak in PPL history, Ninjas in Pajamas. That win streak was a long time ago, though. I gotta be honest, man. The hottest team of phase two, the big boy bears, it's Virtus Pro. I'm so excited for this semifinal. I think going into it, right, you look at the Pittsburgh Knights and Team Envy as the defending world champs versus the eighth seed underdog. What a show from them. That's kind of exceeding expectations, though, to be yeah. honest. This set, however, I think has all of that expectation on it going in. This is an impossible match to call. The hottest team from phase one versus the hottest team from phase two. I, it's almost like who shows up on the day is just going to take it. Absolutely. And if you look at the end of phase two, you've got your number two versus your number three seed. These teams went yeah. one and one during that phase. Some crucial swaps from Virtus Pro kind of in the middle of the year to pick up a raise in Crunzi when they exactly. did off of Penta. Very similar to Simzaloo from the Knights, where it's just a crucial change that was necessary for them, brought them that success. And they beat everybody at least once during phase two. But without further any ado, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get right on into it. The first map of your second semifinal at the Paladins World Championship will be Ascension Peak. Now, this is one map that we did not see at all in our previous semifinal, so a completely new flavor for these two teams going into it. Let's set the stage here. The bands for the other semifinal have, or largely, right, your power front lines. That's yeah. a little bit expected. Your Strix, your Willow. What are you expecting coming into this one? Well. Admittedly, I wasn't even expecting Ascension Peak. This is normally a map that gets banned out by a lot of these teams. Warders Gate, Splitstone Quarry, Ascension Peak, kind of all in the conversation, I would say, for NIP. But when it comes to this map, you're going to have snipers that can be very potent. But I think we'll probably see more of the same. Willow kind of in that conversation, very, very effective. You can kind of control the high ground like no other. Look at the faces on your screen. You're seeing Diggy Dog. You're seeing like it's Pintner. You're seeing guys that want their first crack at a world championship. Fischeko as well. These two guys doing it with Fnatic. That roster no longer together. They blew up, separated. There's so much history here between these two teams. Whether you look at Bittner versus Fischeko, you've got Cus Cutie making it through to the finals. Dosup's playing for Vir Virtus Pro. One of his old teammates from that DreamHack Founders Tournament, Gormizer, with Envy eliminated from this event. Yeah. One of the players from the Founders Tournament is going to be crowned champion this weekend some point, someone's going to be able to do so. You have NIP coming in with quite a few people who haven't gotten to taste that victory in a while. Some who haven't even gotten to taste a victory yeah. at land. And this is the weird thing I was looking at it. When you're looking at the history of those players, like I was looking at championships, who's won lands, where have they been? And then it occurred to me that Bees and Alex went from Mouse Sports, who if you were watching a year ago, you kind of laugh at them. I mean, they're not the team in Europe that anyone expects to do anything. Now you've got Bees coaching in IP, Alex on one of the best teams in the league, both coming through to being able to play at this level. It's a ridiculous change of pace for those two guys. 
a lot on the line, I think, for NIP. In such a storied matchup, it, it, it is a little bit easy to be overshadowed, and I think it's a good time to, you know, just take a quick peek at Alex, right? Like, this is a guy that comes from that mouse sports squad, extremely struggling team. Eventually, they break up. He's a last-second pickup yeah. for this season starts, and it paid off. Like we said, in phase one, the longest win streak in PPL history from Ninjas in pajamas, and Alex helped him do it from really zero to hero. I mean, he has made such a turnaround in his career this year. I mean, you want to talk about last second pickups. One of my favorite things is thinking about the fact that Virtus Pro, you, Ule Ule was a <laughs> team they got was supposed to come in. And they still don't have him. That was their original plan coming into it. This team, though, has been more dominant. They've got a lot of picks that they want. The Willow, the Inara, very, very classy for them. A lot of play that they've been able to bring with it. You get the Mave in there as well with the Ruckus. Everything feels comfortable right now for them. The last thing will more than likely be for... Actually, no, they have the Mave for a raise. So needing that last support for Vex. And you know that guy's flexible. He can play whatever he wants. Such a good time to talk about that Penta roster that upset the world at the mid-season Invitational. That roster picked clean by the PPL team, yeah. stripped of all of its talent. But all of that talent made it to the stage here today. So perhaps one of the most accomplished minor league teams of all time ever to come through that system. And what a system it was to put so much talent on the stage here today. Have to pay respects for Ovim. Have to pay respects, that's right. He, he leads others to a treasure that he may not possess. The draft just about getting rounded out here. The ninth and 10th picks being locked in so far. Which team do you got? Right now, that's, that's a scary lineup from Virtus Pro. I don't think I want to be on the receiving end of Vex playing any kind of Furia. You have a lot of power picks for an IP, though. I think a lot of it will come through. Bird with the IO. How exactly he's going to make that work? Their team is all aggression. It's it what is. was winning them in phase one. So I feel like they could pull it out here. Got to get in there, man. Aggression has been the theme of the year. The team that has been able to kind of put the most pressure on the game and dictate the pace at which it is played has more often than not come out on top. When you look at this Virtus Pro lineup, you look at the ability to just hit the go button with the inflame. And I don't know what NIP could do to stop that, man. I mean, you have so many tools at your disposal, but it's all about how you use it. Enough from us, guys. Let's get down into the action. Thank you so much up there from the Alienware Lounge. I'm fun. Of course, I wouldn't be anywhere without my better half, Chris. Yeah, we are glued together, and I am so excited to be here at HRX in the World Championship semifinals watching NIP versus VP. This was my first PPL cast when I started doing okay. these two teams. I can't believe I'm here again watching them do it, but last time that was an, that was an eight game set, more or less. Something had to happen in the middle, but we are here moving in. A great draft by NIP, I think, I agree. for this map. Ashcon IO, double off tank IO, so tough to deal with, especially on Ascension Peak. It's so easy to get that point pressure. We're already Virtus Pro have the control over on the right side of the point. They are doing their thing by forcing NIP out and onto the lower ground. Alex is already right there, using the ice block, but it's a couple daggers to blink in and blink out. The movement might be a little bit too much, but Dosip is gonna get that first blow. Ray's actually playing a pretty long time, and Doe comes in for that pinch here. Tenor, very low, might not be able to make it away, and it looks like Doe's going for the kill. Dosip is going for the kill, he does not care. The body block is there, but a good kinetic burst to send Anara off of the side. Diggy Dog, that's gonna be one of the first kills that his team's gonna be able to get. Great aggression, I think, from VP, knowing the angle to go. Small misstep by Alex, not connecting the air shots onto a raise when he was putting on that pressure, but you gotta hit what you gotta hit. Right now, though, NIP have to retouch the objective. 81% and climbing for VP's first point. Crunzi doesn't want to let him in easy. Crunzi wants to move in. The commander's grab goes out. Bittner with some good peel. His off tank is going to be able to live, but not for very much longer when Arrays gets a hold of him. 93%, another double kill for the man with the daggers right now. 99% for Virtus Pro. Alex opening things up on NIP's side, taking care of their support. They don't have any more healing. The pounce goes out, but Bonker's going to be able to take down Arrays. Did VP rush it a little bit? No support. They moved in without anything else. This Fae Flight maybe can make a difference with Bonker going down, but now Doe potentially staring down that barrel. Diggy pulling back with the shield, but that won't save him for long from Willow. 78% to 99. Overtime is a factor. Alex Blinkson gets that overtime timer. 
He's allowing his team for a chance to be able to catch right back up. Blinks up, goes to the window. Nice movement from him. Blinks right back. And now no one's able to touch the point. The inflame goes out. They want to make sure they cap this. They want the first point. Alex blinking in the ice block to dodge the fire strike. Bender gets a double bird, gets one. And you have a 93% to 99 from NIP being behind. They are the ones making sure they can win this first point fight. Bird and Tender, the double bow is turning around, finding all the cleanup kills there at the very end. Cannot believe that they managed to turn that around on its head, but NIP managed to pull it out here. And now, Bunker holding this high ground. Pretty solid positioning. Could look for an overpower, but doesn't want it to be Fish. Doesn't he want someone more valuable. Take more health out of the fight, and it's oh, gonna nice. be doing ruckus. It's gonna be crunchy. Okay, don't throw him up in the sky. Yes, throw him down. Make sure he cannot find his way back. Ruckus has two dashes. He's gonna be able to make it back on the stage when he needs to, but Pacheco finds a kill onto NIP's healer. Bird, the aisle is gone, but Bitter with another double. Really a triple. Killed one right before this fight ended up breaking out, and now Anara's being focused down. She's gone too. With two minutes left, NIP have a chance to still push. At the very least for VP, the cart was not moving during that because of that pressure put on. Sounds like an ice storm came out early. No, still 60% there. Now they're still holding here. They want to find an advantage to move in, but Vex is still dead, so most of their damage will stick if they can deny that out of combat health regen. But Ziggy locking down this right side. A lot of ultimates up, and this early in the game, you can be willing to spend them to capture that objective. If you lose it, the game's not over, and it looks like they're willing to spend Hexafire coming out early. Hexafire actually takes care of Luna. They no longer have a way to push the point. They can't make it back. They're already really, really low. Alex being focused. He's taken care of as well on the right side. Bonker is really, really low. Has to back up on the con. Minute and 20 seconds left. Nice rockets coming out from Crunchy to make sure he gets that very last kill with a minute and 15. The timer is still going down. Hexafire, Fayfly, two very safe ultimates to use. Fayfly charges very quickly, and Hexafire is kind of hard to find a space for. So if you see it, you take it. You want that tab as much as it can, value wise. And VP now, aggressive defense. All you want to do on defense is burn away the clock, but Pacheco goes down, maybe a little bit too zealous, and VP in a much worse position, especially with Bonker on the flank. You've got a minute left, Cruncy and Josephs want to be able to get that kill on the bitter, but he gets healed right back up thanks to the IO. The DR pocketing is a lot of raise. Wants a piece as well. You already see he's being cornered. 101 health to none. You have a two for two trade, still even on both sides with 35 seconds. Vex gets kill of his own. The wall goes up to try and peel, but it's misplaced. Yeah, actually, they were getting pressure cap in the back the whole time with the respawns. Now, Bonker coming back to help because of the people coming back from spawn. But Doe, the point tank for VP is going to be so staggered by the end of this. I don't think there's any way he gets out. I think he knows it. Prince is trying to save him. This DR for some dominance. Very good assert. Dominance gets the three man stun. The Ice Storm gets dropped down right on top of that. And they're able to clean up three kills for NIP. They have to be gone. They have the IOO. They have the Scout, one of the more defensive ultimates. You can see whoever it is you need to globally throughout the map. They've got five seconds left for NIP to try and push this car in with four ultimates on VP side. VP have everything in the toolbox, though, more or less, except for Hexafire. Luna's gonna help them so much with this point contest as Diggy fights on the side against Crunchy. Or he's on a huge flank, but it doesn't find much of anything. He's trying to find the damage, but all he finds is himself dead. Pacheco, Crunchy, though, are gonna be able to clean up that mess. They get rid of Alex, they get rid of Bird, and Bittner is next. Bonkers being focused down. He's taken care of as well. The overtime is there, but it's already gone. The Penta aggression helping things out for VP so much. That dive into the back line, Cruncy and Arrays. Arrays didn't find much, but he drew fire. Let Cruncy pretty much clean up everybody else there. And VP, with a healthy suite of ultimates to head into the next fight for sure. It's gonna be so tough though, against double off tank IO. They can get so aggressive. Furia, she's pretty good at dueling the 1v1s, definitely more in her favor. But those dives, she has no moments of intangibility like some other supports do. Damba can CC someone, slither away, not be touchable. But Furia, she's always going to be vulnerable. Her Wings of Wrath don't make her invincible, they just do 600 damage. So they can find that aggressive opening, NIP, that should be their forte. Could be another mid for them, even in the face of all those alts. Got a one-to-one -one tie between the two Titans. Clash of the Titans, some might say. One to one for Virtus Pro and NIP. Like you said, they have a whole slew of ultimates on Virtus Pro's side. They can use whatever it is they want to. And they're, op they're opting to open this up with an inflame, but a good Hexafire to counter that out. Bonker has the battle shot. Make sure he does not get taken down. Bird is gone as well because of the Faith Life. Pacheco finds not one, but two. He's looking at another one. Bonker and the rest of them are all grouped up. He's going to flutter to give himself some DR, but a good crossbow shot from Bittner in the air. They get rid of Bonker as well. Virtus Pro 21 to 21. Dosips gets a kill as another frontliner, but the percentage is 
building in Virtus Pro's favor. Bunker was just a little bit too greedy. He held on to that overpower. He's like, yeah, Kruncy, I know you're going to dash in. I know you're going to Hexafire. But he waited until he was CC immune to spend it. He got the refund, but that's not going to help him too much right now. 78%. They need to touch to stop this. Only one moment to trigger the overtime. There it is. Here comes Alex, but can they get anything else? Bunker's on the side. He's trying to put pressure on the Kruncy, but you're not going to be able to win that 1v1. Even with a battle shout, overtime is still a factor. If NIP can touch again, they can cause it to reset, and they do. I think he's going to be able to shoulder bash his way or try to fight his way out, but Benner with a good flank. He's going to take care of Dosefs. They got rid of a raise as well. Dickie is going to go down thanks to Pacheco, but Kruncy, the two of them are putting up so much pressure. Vex is still alone on the point to try and contest that, but a good crossbow shot from Bittner once again is going to find its mark. A double kill for Bittner as well, 63 to 99. Kruncy's just so aggressive, and at this point, the hit sound sounds like it's just part of the crossbow. Tenor is just not missing in this fight. Doe is close enough to contest the objective. Doesn't have seismic crash, and they're burning through that earthen guard right now, especially with Bonker on the flank, but Fishiko gets him very low. Bonker's already low on the side. The Desmond gets dropped down. He was not able to heal the battle shout in that area. The Sir Dominus gets dropped as well. Kruncy tries to come around on the side to provide some cover, but Dosev actually went down. Close to point, but Shekko actually gets out. But Bittner, once again, his beautiful flank is able to get not one, but two kills. Two minutes, 15 seconds left, and NIP are the ones to make their second point on Ascension Peak. It feels like the Tenor versus Crunzy show. Crunzy's putting on an absolute clinic on how to be aggressive on Ruckus and get away with it. But damage-wise, Pacheco keeping up in hole 15 and 7 for Tenor. A Faith Light comes out to try to slow things down. Bird gets away, but Tenor should fall for this. Bittner does take a lot of damage. He's going to have to go down for the hex fire. Comes out to make sure they get that kill. You heard the overpower go off, and he does find it. Vex, yeah, he already off the side. Thanks to Bonker, a good overpower by him with a minute and 40 seconds left. Two picks for VP, though, even in the face of that, without any heals. Out of combat regen. You don't really need your support to win fights if you're careful enough. Ever from NIP respawning, but actually, looks like someone was coming from behind. Not sure if they see him back there. It looks like Crunchy might have spotted him, and the hunt begins trying to save Vex from getting spawn camps. But they're in time. No, oh, Bonker no. trades the healer out again. Their healer is going to be gone. They have no healing, but they are able to take out Bonker. But it's going to make it harder for BP to try and defend without any source of sustain. Already on the backside, Alex is trying to engage in a 1v1 versus a raise, but they're both going to try and opt to opt out of that fight. They get Joseph though, and Diggy Dog goes down for the trading out frontliner for frontliner. Crunchy's having the, the worst the worst feeling is a ruckus when you can't get in and you're just long range spamming and you know it's not doing anything, but now it's doing something. There's an aggressive push from him. Finds Bird in the back, no healing, no DR, and Fishiko follows up with Alex. Yeah, already the kills, the bodies are piling up on Virtus Pro's side with 45 seconds left. And I have pushed the card about halfway. But if you see it right there up at the top, the, the payload is moving backwards. If you are not on that payload, if you are moving it forward or contesting it, it's going to fall back, meaning that NIP are going to lose some progress. Yeah, and even then, if you have a fight that you know is going badly, sometimes it's worth a touch just to stop the decline. You want to be able to maintain the objective capture you've already gotten. Looks like it won't be a problem here, though. Check out another Faith Flight charged. Might look to spend it because it charges so fast, but we're getting a little bit dangerous now, and he's already has such good poke with this Blast Flower talent. Diggy trying to fight on the side, but looks like he's getting completely stuffed by Doe. 81 Excuse me, for Diggy Dog on his ultimate. They have about eight seconds left in this fight. Alex is going to be able to find that trade. Wants to a raise, but Pacheco's diving in the dead zone. He gets one. Actually misses the last shot on a Bittner. Diggy has to fall back to peel for his damage dealer. The flutter goes up. Gives himself a little bit of DR damage reduction, but still it's going to go down. But two kills for Virtus Pro. And so was able to contest the NIP side. Crunchy is just all over them. This high ground to low ground defense potential coming out from VP is so impactful. Crunchy can get so far into the back line, kind of unstopped honestly he's on a 10 streak right now and five ultimates up for them almost five ultimates up on the other side 86 and 86 over there means that this is going to be a very close fight no comeback mechanic to speak of either for those of you new to the game the deficit between teams the team with the lower score will have potential to cap faster normally the game ticks up about three percent at a time if there's a one point difference, it's three and four, three and four. A double point difference, the highest Point's comeback can go is seconds. all four ticks. This game, right now, 2 2, no comeback mechanic on the board at all. So, not something to worry about, but we will be seeing that later for sure. So, all these ultimates up. VP can get very aggressive with this. If they go in with an inflamed Faith Light plus a Midnight to back it up, more or less global ultimate supporting one of the most mobile abilities in the whole game. 
already have a 2 2 tie, just like my man Kreslik was saying. The healing goes out, and so does the end flame. They want to be able to start the fight. Crunchy going around for that flank. They're all backing up. They're giving them respect. The Begon goes up, but Pacheco's all the way up in the sky. Bird trying to call it a 1v1, and he's going to go down. So is Pacheco, though. Tanner got out. that kill. One for one. Yes, Henner was the one who hit that shot onto Pacheco in the yeah, air. Russell. That wasn't the hit stand. It wasn't enough. And here comes the Hexafire. Already the Hexafire on the bonker. He's going to be able to take him down. 24% for Virtus Pro. Alex is also going to be able to find himself some damage. But Crunchy was a little bit too low. Tried to push him out. Does not work. Diggy and Array finding themselves one kill apiece, leaving both teams at four players. You can see the value of NMP's comp here. Just throw Luna on the point. Let her contest. Everyone back up and heal, and we're just going to have better health than them. Overpower connecting onto Dose Ups. They should be able to get this kill while farming Ult Charge off of them as well. That's a pretty big deal for the economy, and now NIP regained control of the objective. 45% to 27. NIP, they have their assert dominance. They're all grouped up in there. I believe Diggy knows that he's just going to try and hold on to his ultimate as long as he possibly can. No ults on the side of DP, though. 87% for NIP, and still steadily building Luna is able to catch at that point. So now they're able to get the zone going. A race has to try and go in, or he's trying to find his opening, but still, nothing yet. The Sir Dominance is going to be big for just if things turn around in it against NIP. The Sir Dominance will completely flip it. There it is in the back line. Pressuring off Pacheco, but he's the worst target. He can flutter away. He has the DR. He recommits, though. He stays in oh, he's alive. He barely gets healed in the last oh. second. Right next, finally, Diggy finds the kill, and Alex is following up. That's absolutely insane. Two for two already. Once again, three members left. Now, two members left on NIP's side. 63 percent a good pyre strike another in flame they're focusing down on the diggy dog and bonker they're the two frontliners left they're the last two alive one of them goes down diggy tries to charge out but crunchy's low 85 health and he's gonna be taking out too diggy is at 124 health but dose has to move up and finish off that kill the timing of that too is awful wall also i think potentially blocked the eevee but it doesn't matter luna so much point pressure from this io alex might be caught out here goes down makes it tough but luna bought just enough time for bonker to come back to the fight over time is ticking down by 99 to 99 percent who will be the ones to break this round tie? Diggy's on the side. He knows the raise is there. The fake fight goes out. Firing right down on the bonker. He cannot use that shield to shield himself up, at least vertically. Bender goes down as well. Pacheco with a double. He swapped targets to Diggy as well. A triple kill for him. And still, Virtus Pro are able to capture that point with a 3-2 lead against NIP. Fake fight so impactful against Ashcon comps. They just can't deal with it. The Seed Shield doesn't do anything. Khan's personal shield doesn't block him from anything above. So much of that around the corner pressure making it impossible for NIP to find much of anything aggressively. Diggy, I felt had a great performance that mid, but you can see one of the weaknesses of Iowa. She doesn't really handle getting dove that well. Top deaths on NIP right now is Bird because of Arrays, because of Frenzy, because of these save fights from Pacheco. He has no answer to it. He might not have an answer to this aggression either. Yeah, he ends up getting body blocked right by that just as Pacheco was about to get stunned. He actually gets healed right back up thanks to Vex and you've got Arrays, Crunchy, one of the two of them really, one kill a piece and Bonker is going to be the one that takes down Crunchy, going to try and end that streak but look at NIP, they're in their base Virtus Pro are keeping them locked down there and they've got a side to crash, but an even better overpower right to the spawn door to get that instant kill. That definitely is going to buy them some time and that's what you have to do on defense, just buy time to not let the enemy team convert the payload right now, though VP has a really strong position, it's going to be hard for NIP to bust out of their spawn and push them out here, especially in the face of a Willow Bonker, dangerously low. Thought he was gonna get shot with some around the corner spam, but he manages to live. Diggy Tenner took some good ground on the side, but this fate flight's gonna deny that. One minute and five seconds left. They are using their ultimates. They wanna make sure they can find the inflame as well. Bittner goes down. Diggy actually has to shoulder bash his way out. Luna's on point to contest, but Bonker, Bittner, Diggy Dog, three of them down, two of them locked up in their base. Virtus Pro have the key, but they are not gonna release them from their cells right now. Right now, though, Crunchy, you're on the side. Alex buying as much time as he can with the ice block. Luna going in to contest the point, but this bulldozer's online. He's going to go down immediately, and everyone on NMP is diving the point. They're diving the point. They get rid of a raise as well. Vex, the support, finds himself another kill. But Pacheco is able to take care of Bittner. The assert dominance goes out. 30 seconds left. They are looking for their opportunity. Ultimates are flying out one after the other with Alex finding another opening kill and a chance at life for NIP. Assert dominance so impactful, forcing VP back. The ultimate's up left on either team. Everyone's kind of panicked throwing them out, and you would be too in this situation. Erase tries to chase out Diggy. He bashes to spawn. Erase fighting on the side. He might catch Bonker here. Maybe so good at chasing down Khan, but it looks like Alex is going to protect him. Yeah, he wants to make sure that Erase does not get any free reign. 
onto his off chain. Right now, though, Bonkers would really love the dead zone. was already right there. Another in flame, an even better Ice Storm. And Lance Alex, the double kill. Bittner with another one, and he's being killed up. That IO pocketing is a lot, and Luna with a good stun is gonna be able to make sure she takes care of Vex. Dosage goes down as well, and now we are looking at a 3-3 for game one for NIP versus VP. And I'd be decided to say, hey, Kresnik, I know you once said that we can't play Eevee, but uh, yeah, let's watch Alex get a triple kill here with a fantastic Ice Storm to stop both DPSs on the side. Great play by him, I think. Very impactful, turning that fight around. Good for them, too, that that was the main ultimate that was used, the fast charging one. They'll have it more than likely in this final point fight, the most impactful one. Inflame used on the other side, same exact deal, though. Inflame charges so fast with the healing and the damage being dealt by the Fury up. It's going to be back up for Vex. It's going to be something that they will be utilizing late in the fight for sure. The only thing they have to open it, though, is a Hexafire. That is not an ultimate that you normally see do anything without another. You usually use it to zone them into something else, or you get insanely lucky and they're not ready for it. You're stuck standing still. You have no extra damage mitigation. You are just getting destroyed from anyone that can shoot you. Let's see how VP use it. All right, so the power is building up. And just like you were saying, all the guns are in play. And they're going to be able to find the opening kill and another one as well. Bird has to back up with Pacheco. Looking really, really low. He has to be able to back up. But already the kills are piling up in Virtus Pro side. What was a very close fight is now shifted towards Virtus Pro's favor. They have the overpower, though. And I piece side bonkers waiting. And yes, that's what he wanted. He wanted to make sure anybody that was trying to push up was caught out, throws a raise directly down. But look, they can't make it back to point. They're definitely trying, but 84%. We have Alex, the EV, being able to touch, possibly cause that overtime. Alex did make it at the last second, and now Pacheco overtime. has to back up. OT's going in. They don't have a cert dominant, so only be gone in scout. scout. Those ultimates won't help them. Ooh. Nice disengage bow into a good crossbow bow. It's going to leave him with a double. Bittner, nicely done by him. But they get rid of Bird. Bittner on a tear right now in the back line. He got two kills already with a third, a potential fourth. But Alex is going to be able to clean that one up, not put as much stress directly onto Bittner right there. 99% to 39. Once again, these two Titans are at each other's throats right now. Bittner puts the team on his back and just wipes the floor with Virtus Pro. And now they have a mountain to climb to get back in. They have Midnight. They're going to have Inflame soon. Two great ultimates, but a race very low when he uses that. He might not make it out. Looks like he barely does. But now they have so much relying on this Inflame. Oh, but they use the Assert Dominance right at the entrance of the point to make sure they can't make it back. But the Inflame goes out. One last battle cry for Virtus Pro. Pacheco with one kill. But Bunker, Alex, NIP are not looking to take this. Lying down with Dosas being one of the only ones left remaining, along with Vex. You have it right here. They're looking at him. The wall goes up, keeps himself alive, and he's still locked in a 1v1 with Bunker. But there's no overtime available unless a race able to touch him. He does. And oh my goodness, they're still stalling. The health is so bad on NIP's side, too. Io can't really spread heals. Two kills for VP. Oh there's no goodness. way they turn this around. 1v1 on the side, two for two kills right now, Fawn. Bittner and Alex got the, again, a double kill for Bittner. And already game one, absolutely intense for NIP. I cannot believe that that was turned around by Tenor there at the last moment. VP almost had it, and the weakness of Io almost showed. A lot of deaths for Bird, really hard to keep the team sustained, but as it went on, they were able to barely pull through on the backs of their DPS, connecting every single shot on the back of EV self-sustain. What a phenomenal comeback, though, from NIP really, at the end. I'm really, really glad that you actually just ended up bringing that up, because you mentioned it before. You said that that was the weakness. That was yeah. it. That Io was about to be shown for, I mean, really, what it really is, it's the fact that she can only pop Pocket. That is really her one of her only capabilities that she offers to a team other than the point yeah. cap from Luna. Yeah, for sure. It was so much, I think, that the I was bringing there at the end. That high deaths, like getting through that pressure was very, very difficult, but in the end, NIP. Great turnaround by Tenor. Ab absolutely phenomenal from NIP. If that's what we can expect this all whole set, I would not leave my seat right after this break. We'll be right back in the game too. When missions call for a team that exercises diplomacy or keeping a cool head. A light touch. Or restraint. You should call a different team. Because that is not what we do. 
It's the opposite, in fact. You guys ready? Now you're just showing off. Oh, company, that's what's next. Ninjas in Pajamas, Virtus Pro, that's what's right now. Joining me in the Alienware Consortium of Analytical Authority is Mr. William Gormizer Newberry. You gonna get over that name at some point today? I don't know if I can remember it. You know, Kelly had the Alienware Lounge, and, and today it's kind of mine, so I had, to, I had to make it my own in some capacity. Yeah. I mean, I think a consortium is a good word a, for it. That's, that's definitely a, like, that's a $10 word. word. That is a $10 word, boys. We love it. Game one. It looks like we're in for it again, Gormizer. I mean, an absolute wall-to-wall -wall banger on oh, yeah. Ascension Peak. So much to talk about from that game one. But I mean, breaking it down after the po or into the post-game stats, you got to just be looking right at his Spitner. 28 oh, yeah. and 17 on this Cassie. He was on one, man. And that's one of those moments. You get 3-3, and you're wondering what exactly can keep this game alive for us. And the answer, okay. if you're in IP, <laughs> is always did, going bro. to be Bittner. <laughs> Is he the only Maybe one? No, 100,000, 155 there for Fischeko. And that was the question. I sat down with you. The first thing I said was, this was the contest and kind of argument to see what's better. Fischeko's Willow, Bittner's Cassie. Yeah, man. The answer at the end of the day was Bittner's Cassie. And this guy just made it so much room for them at the very end. Crucial kills, crucial moments, kind of a level head to keep things rolling. And here's what's so insane about this game is that I think that was kind of a gamble, right? If you give Pacheco Willow on this map, you know what you're signing up for if you're trying to defend this payload in oh, yeah. open ground. I think you're banking on this game ending inside of the point room, right? Where his room to fly is it's good, but it's limited, right? That's the type of range that Tenor's going to be able to deal with. And it was exactly what they got, right? You're wanting it to kind of go into that throne room, a faith flight and a good position. Most people don't even look up when they see that. If you don't have too much hit scan on your team, which Cassie, not normally known for her ability to kind of hunt things out of the yeah. sky, it's usually nice free skies, but he's locked down, easily controlled there. And NIP, a 3-3. Granted, maybe a little bit too much on the wire for them. They got down pretty far there at the last point before they finally fought back. But once they had control, it was easy to maintain. Huge numbers from Fraseco and from It's Bittner, two former teammates who, have, you know, when they were together, had one of the best records Paladins oh, yeah. had ever seen. These guys were absolutely insane, making it to final after final after final. But Gormizer, they just couldn't cross the finish line. That team splits up. They're in different teams now, going head-to-head -head now for the final spot up for grabs in the World Championship Finals. Both of these guys want it bad, man. I think worse than anything, given the record that they have had up until this point. And no matter what, one of them still makes it to the finals, but you have to know the second place curse might still fall on somebody. It. That would Loved be it. the most heartbreaking thing for them between that. I mean, Bittner has made it up there so many times. But even when you look at, you know, people like Diggy, people like Alex on NIP that haven't gotten there before or a raise on the other side, his first land was yeah. NSI. This guy on screen, I mean, one of the best Paladins players to ever do it. I think rivaling Bugsy in terms of the most flexible Paladins player there has ever been to grace the keys. When you look at where they come from, right? Yeah. It's kind of awesome to see, you know, Godfather Bugsy give the blessing, give the send-off tweet to both of his protégés today, right? He was the guy that played alongside Fischeko and Tenor, kind of on their come-up. So they both embody him, I think, in, in a little bit of different ways, right? Bugsy was really known for that Eevee. I think Fischeko has taken that mantle and elevated it, right? Bugsy was also known yeah. for his flexibility. I think Tenor has taken that mantle and elevated it. These guys have specialized in their labor divisions, right? They are looking to be the best at their craft. We're into the draft now for game number two here. Bands, somewhat standard here. Willow, Strix, Atlas, and likely Makoa. One of the fun things about NIP you're mentioning the flexibility of Tenor. He's listed as one of their flexes. Alex listed as the other flex. It's, Normally it's, the off yeah. tank is the flex. Dickie's listed as a damage player for them. <laughs> because at the end of the day, they can run triple DPS. They could run triple frontline. They can run any strategy on, that they fight. want to. We've even seen them on maps like Timber Mill decide that they want to pull out a quad DPS. Granted, I don't think we got Blades to see it work in regular done. season play, but it still didn't look bad for them. That amount of flexibility is part of the reason they got such a long win streak in phase one. It's also part of the reason that pretty much anything goes. They don't have to worry too much about the draft. They do want priority picks, but 
Ooh. You get a victor, that's solid on Ice Mines. Either team can play it. I think Bittner going to be deadly with him in his hands. It's Bittner, Pacheco. We know the story there. Let's shift the conversation a little bit over to Dosips and Vex, who are looking to join their former teammate in the world final. Cus Cutie already punching his ticket alongside the Pittsburgh Knights from earlier. Cus Cutie already there. Dosips from DreamHack Young Shopping Sweden. I hope I got that right. All the way at the Founders Tournament three years ago. Neither of them have been able to crown themselves world champion ever since. Vex was kind of like the sixth man yeah. for that cryptic squad that sported names like Evil Eye, names like Dosip, names like Cus Cutie. They were able to get that big win at DreamHack Valencia a couple of years ago, but they want the ring, Gormizer. They want the final prize. And when you look at it, Vex, we've even talked about this, and this would be getting forward, but Learn from Cuss. Yeah. So you've got former teammates, a uh, kind of mentor, to tutor since the situation going on with them. A lot of interesting things following them. And the best thing about it is that you can see the level of play and kind of where that came down. A lot of the same champions that Cuss had kind of excelled at in that style of play, Vex adopts and brings out for his team. The Furia, the Io look very, very good when Virtus Bro kind of pick it up. And depending on how they're feeling at any given time, you can expect oh, to see them. Things already starting to spice up here in the draft on Ice Mines. Grover's been locked in for Virtus Pro and a Bomb King for Ninjas in pajamas. Drogos being hovered as well for Virtus Pro. I mean, there's a lot of spice on either side, right? There's some seriously world-class blaster players in this game. That wasn't untrue for the first semifinal either, but we just didn't get the presence from those picks in particular early on in this set. This is game two. These guys are already bringing out something new. That Drogo specifically is something that Fish Echo has been playing for years, you has been playing better than everyone here. else for years, and I assume as long as he keeps playing Paladins, he's going to keep doing it better than everyone else. He brings it out on maps where it shouldn't work and matchups where it shouldn't work, and he still is able to control so much of the game. You're bringing it out on Ice Mines, it's gonna be combustible, and he knows how to play it. He knows the angles he needs. This is typically where you would see, you know, a team maybe like the Knights go for something since Zarini can play it like a Terminus because it's a good way to counter him on Ice Mines. But they don't have anything to really withstand this Drogos too well on the side of NIP. A lot of pressure, I think, on the Bomb King to find the right matchup. Gormizer, we did not get to see Ascension Peak. We did see Ice Mines in our yeah. first semifinal of the day. This is a very different flavor, meaning that when either of these teams end up clashing with the Pittsburgh Knights in the finals, we're in for a show. It's game two. It's time for Ice Mines. Vaughn Kresnick, take it away. Thank you so much from the Alienware Lounge up there, man. And Ice Mines, you are right. This is a totally different flavor right now. It is a slower, more slower paced map, but it is extremely polarizing to the people who are able to win those mid fights. Yeah, it's definitely sided towards teams that have better ultimates, things that you can bring to a mid fight and have a decisive win in zone aggressively. There's really only one route back to the objective. If you cover that, not many options for the team. So mid fights are crucial. But this one, not a single ultimate on the board. No matter what team has better ones, this is just coming down to the better team. Early victor dismounts, but it seems like it's still pretty close aggressively. Shekel on this combustible gets an early poke on Alex. The first shots being flung one after the other, so the percentage is going to build in NIP's favor for a very brief moment. And Virtus Pro are going to be able to step on and now gain some cap time for themselves. But everyone's playing patiently. No one's committing to a lot. A good direct sticky from Alex right there. On a Pacheco, another good one. That actually leaves the Drogos extremely low. Bonker trying to fire around that corner. pre fire so he can get a kill, but nothing yet. But already, so that Dosa was actually pushing in, trying to get that kill, but because he couldn't, now he's stuck in a very bad spot. Has to fail safe his way out. Barely makes it away at the last moment. Now back up with the con, but Tenor, great angle, catches Doe. Already, they're throwing the they're throwing the bombs right around the corner. They know they're around there. Alex getting a little bit too much damage, but the healing being provided is enough to keep him alive. Pacheco, once again, good rocket. Another good combustible. It explodes. Knocks an R all the way back. Damage over time is not enough to find that kill, though. That would have been a, If that spin got through the barn, it actually, I think it would have gotten two kills in the moment. There it is, knocking everybody in. Alex, maybe in the silent from the Cassie, but doesn't matter too much now. Dragon Punch, potentially coming in, charged so oh, fast, he takes down Bonker. Already took out one of the frontliners. Alex is able to get, get rid of 
Pacheco. Make sure that he's taken care of. 18%, 227. Everyone's taking their time, just like I was saying before. Vex is being focused on point, but Karanti literally just standing there, free firing with Dosa getting a last hit. I cannot believe Vex walked away from that. He was absolutely tempting fate. Dread Serpent knocks down Karanti, but I don't think the damage is there for the kill. No, he has to disengage. A race locking down the side, getting very aggressive. Look how low they are, but he can't follow up. 45% to 27. This is building in Virtus Pro's favor already. Once again, everyone taking their time. They're finding the kills. They're gaining the cap time when they need to, but no one's overly committing. There is yet to actually be a really aggressive zone on either team's side. You have about three ultimates up on IP side. You actually hear the trumpets. The King Bomb's coming in. It's rolling through. And he's going to be able to knock Pacheco right out of the sky. Good bombs, but even better healing. They're one v 2 him right now. He's still going to be able to get that kill. Might be able to kill Vex here, actually. It really depends if Vex can connect this last axe. It's all oh, down. Come on. The healing oh. comes in. Vex does get the kill onto Alex, but he's getting chased down by Bonker. Might be able to barely survive. Good peel from a race. Keeps the body block. Last one, but he's whipsing the shot. Nice. Finally connects it. This whirlwind might get them back in. Very good body blocks coming out from a race to make sure his tank did not go down during that fight, at least for a very, very brief moment to allow themselves some more cap time and some more easy zone. Dosip's in a raise. One kill apiece, 90% to a potential point capture, and it will be for Virtus Pro, the first point on Ice Mines. So many ultimates charged and used. I think VP used every single ultimate they had during that fight. NIP holding onto that barrage, charge at the last moment, but it's, it's a risky ultimate to use when a team's being aggressive into you. You have to sit there and channel the binoculars more or less. Now it's being used because he's in safety, but VP just disengaged. Already they have the Dragon Punch once again. They have one ultimate up for Burst Pro side, but a good water keeps them alive, at least for a little bit longer, but they're already circling him, surrounding him. Erased not with one, but two kills with two minutes still available. They're contesting the point. They're fighting as hard as they possibly can, but Pacheco is going to be able to live for a little bit longer, but Ben is going to make he takes him down. All they're trying to do right now, they're stalling. They don't want him to push up as much as they can, and they're trying to burn some time on NIP's side. Fanatic special, Fish. Tenor just runs in. He's like, all right, Fish, listen. <laughs> Calm down. Please get out of this game for now, and now we can potentially hold with that Drogo's indirect spam out of the picture. So good at not letting people hide around corners, and there's a spin right there. Alex would be dead. Good for that trade now. Tenor is back in the fight. Sure goes back in the fight. Alex pushing up top with Ash. Looks like this might be the moment they want to go in, but Diggy not getting any follow-up. One minute and 20 seconds still remaining. They actually got rid of Bird. Pacheco just drops right down to that window, finds a kill on their support. Now the damage dealer, Bomb King, is going to try and find his opening. But what opening do you have? You have about one frontliner left, and he's still alive. 723 health, and he was still extremely low. A raise, and Alex caught in this one-on-one. -on -one. Diggy too low to try and make this a 2v1. So he's going to have to back up, wait for that healing. They've got about a minute left. Two ultimates up for NIP, three ultimates up for VP. This is showing the value of Bomb King, too. We didn't see it that much in the first set mm. at all, actually. But watching a Bomb King lock down a choke point, make them completely unable to chase down Diggy Dog on top, I think, was a really big deal there. We saw how low Diggy was. His shield didn't even do anything. He was on the edge, so it just <laughs> went off the cliff. Shielded maybe someone on the cart, but no one was there. So not much Diggy got there, but that spam from that Bomb King completely locked down every choke point they could possibly want to take to fu finish up that kill. Yeah, already, once again, a 1-0 score for NIP. They're looking pretty good on Ice Mines, but I mean, Virtus Pro, but this aggression is that they've got, it is so hard to try to break that line they are forming indeed. I mean, once again, what do you think NIP have to do to be able to try and find their chance at life? I mean, they got about a minute left, Kresnik, but what would you do in this situation? If you're NIP, you're on the back foot, you're towards your spawn, would you be willing to throw ultimates even though it's this close to the end of the game? Honestly, I think your tanks have to, well, it's early, so if you're willing to use point ultimates here. At this point, if you use ultimates in a 1-0 fight, if you, if you hold it out, no matter what, you're going 1-1 probably into the next one, and then it's going to be 3-1. There's no way they can win off of the next one if you're the, if you're the attacking team. Defending team, you mostly want to respond. You don't really want to hold on to them, because let's say you don't use them, they cap. You can't win off that. You don't really want to worry too much about that snowball. So ult management, depending on when you use it, depending on the, the point structure up top, very crucial. NIP, though, I think they might have to just pull their tanks back a little bit. Mm -hmm. They have a Victor, they have a Bomb King. They're very good at locking down areas, hitting people around corners with Royal Subjects from the Bomb King or just the, the untalented grenade from the Victor. No shrapnel needed, burst mode mostly used here. Pull back, let the people spam the chokes, let them get the damage in, and then struggle for the kill. Then try to find the frags. That might be what the play is, but it's going to be a lot easier on this last mid. So many chokes to lock down. Yeah, I mean, already, though, like, once again, this is very, very good that NIP are actually able to, I mean, even though the game is currently paused right now, I mean, this is sort of 
calms the nerves. I mean, it allows them to try and regroup yeah. mentally, even though it is a little bit of a technical diff a little bit of a technical difficulty. But once again, I'm glad that you ended up mentioning that because you can use your ultimates towards the end of that. I mean, like you said, it's still a little bit early. It's about a minute left, so they can throw those out, build those back up potentially for the next round. However, once again, I mean, VP, they are just pushing and pushing and pushing this momentum. I mean, do you think that NIP are going to be able to stop it, even though, like I said, it's a minute left, but the card's pretty close already. I think this pause would be good for them, honestly. They, they, they looked very nervous at the start. We saw some of the bolts being missed mm -hmm. by Ray's on VP side. We saw Axis being missed by, by Vex on VP side. And Alex almost didn't get the kill initially at the start with the bombs. And that is a pretty big AoE, so home to calm down, get more acclimated to the stage, even though these players were sitting there for the majority of that first set, getting used to that crowd noise as they play, even though most of them were just doing 1v1s on Frog Isle, honestly looking at that. But I, I wanted to point out too, no, neither team went a dismounting support on Ice Mines. That was something True. that has been meta kind of throughout this entire this entire season of the Premier League. We see Genos Ying, at least in phase two mostly, they were constantly getting picked because they can let the rest of their team get aggressive. NIP, they went the they went the Damba and they're just holding back Tenor. They're letting Tenor be the one to dismount them, sacrificing the early window positioning to get dismounts. It's an interesting trade-off. Are they gaining enough from having a, the non-dismount support? by losing the victor than having the victor there in the first place. You know, with the Genos, the Ying maybe have been better for them. Down 0-1 on this, even though VP don't have a dismount support either, so maybe not. Maybe that tenor presence is what they needed. Do you think there's value to the fact that, I mean, even though they don't have a dismounting support, because I mean, yeah. we've seen that in the past, whether it be PPL, PML, PCL, whatever the case is, I mean, on Ice Mons, like I said, it was very polarizing. Whoever wins those fights really can get the aggressive zone. It takes so long to be able to get back to point or get back to cart, regardless do you think that they might be just trying to focus the fact that they need to be able to win these point fights, they need to be able to win these mid fights to try and get themselves ahead? Is it really worth it having that dismount support? It's, it might be. Against, against the Grover, if you're going to not take a support that will be doing that, I think you take Grover, which is what Virtus Pro did. They have this Grover AoE sustained. You don't have to peek any unnecessary angles through these chokes that this Victor and this Bomb King are going to be locking down. That's what I think you need to gain by losing that. Otherwise, the positioning on mid when you need to be in their face as quickly as possible, it's just too important. Yep. I mean, 45 seconds left and remaining. You still have, like, you, like we've been saying, plenty of time to be able to try and push this card in. If you're, Virtus Pro's or if you're on Virtus Pro side, a 1-0 lead already. The bombs are coming out. Alex Poppy bombs himself back, but a good rocket from Pacheco is going to be able to kill Alex and make sure that he is not able to move at all. But even better, they're going to be able to stop Diggy Dog's dash right there, take care of him, and now Anar is right around that side. She walled herself in to make sure she can't take any more damage. Bunker had to stack all of his cooldowns to stay alive because there's only one left, but he's still going to fall. Hopefully the response for NIP State can get there, and no, Virtus Pro take it in, and that was the, a great aggressive take by them in those top areas. When you have the complete wrap, the people on the staircase have nowhere to go. You saw Alex try to pop you back. Where's he gonna go? There's no cover back there. One measly brick you can stand behind that all that high ground just lets you shoot over. Right, exactly. I mean, once again, a raise right here. Even in this replay, you just see the type of prominence it is that he has. And I'm glad that you mentioned that before. I mean, like, even though they were actually able to get the pause because of technical difficulties, they were missing seconds. quite a few shots. I mean, there's a lot of nerves up there, dude. There's a lot on the line to be able to try and make sure they can win this. It is, and we'll have to see how those nerves even out as we go closer and closer to a potential match point for either Five, team. Four, I want to mention Bonker three, right now. I've two, always talked about how I think he's... One. The reason NIP succeeded was that double off tank, his ability to play the Ash the Khan if they need to. But when NIP get put onto these traditional point tanks, he's kind of struggled over the season, and right now 0-5 and five on the Inara. Even in the face of the Drogos and Cassie, not the easiest game, it's still not the best. Nice. Sesma Crash coming out, but who did it even connect on? They still got Tenor off the map. They actually still were able to use so many ultimates and just one after the other, they're just falling off. Come on, man. I mean, I don't, I, you're standing next to the edge and I mean, you're gonna get knocked off by so many people on Virtus Pro's side. You have to be aware of that. Okay, I'm not sure what the Sesma Crash connected on, but too much pressure from the overpower for them to be able to follow up. And now, Checko, line pressure with dose ups in the front. Try to zone Diggy. No dash, no way out. This is going to be a massive stagger. And Ash is the best person to touch with the King Bomb. Coming in from the back, do they even know? He's actually behind. They stun Crunzi, but he should walk away from this. He is. He's just going to have his shield right up. The timer was going down and down and down. But still, BP's percentage is still steadily rising upward. A good kill on the Alex, thanks to Joseph's 
Mindful Eye just being able to watch out for those rotations. The good combustible is going to find one kill on the Bittner. Another good rocket on the bird. Now they focus fire directly on the bunker. Wall goes up, but you can't hide from the dragon. A raise is going to be able to get that last hit and 96% for Virtus Pro to an overtime to a potential point capture. What a 180 flick by Finch there at the end to kill Bird is going away. It sounds like ultimates that were spent 5 VP earlier were fantastically used and they're getting close to the whirlwind and the dragon punch to keep this aggressive zone. But NIP have their spawns. Fish might go down. Good positioning by Tenor. Cruncy will follow and NIP might be able to set up this aggressive zone if VP give it up. I mean, we've been mentioning this before, but take a look at this. I mean, Bird is pro moving all the way in and now they're backing up. NIP just have that pressure. That's just ice mines. That's what you can pretty much expect to see. Can I just say that a race hasn't died yet? It just appeared to be a race oh. undying throughout this, even with all the damage that NIP have. But I guess Diggy really hasn't been able to get onto him. Hasn't been able to cross that gap. Great shot onto Alex. Rush. Rush might be the first death, but they get away. It's not going to be enough, but they are going to be able to at least find something onto Kruntzi. Which that's going to be good. One of their frontliners done, but Pacheco makes sure he evens up the odds by taking care of NIP's frontliner as well. Once again, the cauterizers are coming online. You've got record, the anti-healing, the shield break potential. You have the opportunities right there. They've already slowed Diggy Dog right there, and they're going to be able to take care of him as well with a minute and 30 seconds left. Pacheco is going to be peel for for his team. He was looking really, really low, but he's still going to be able to walk out alive. Well, it seems like every time NMP gets zoned in that position, their only game plan is to kill Pacheco, and it didn't even happen that time. Great peel by them. Great, honestly, heads up play by Arrays. He body blocked, even when they weren't winning the fight handily. He still body blocked ass shots for Fish to keep him alive, and clearly that's who NIP want. Look at this aggression in main bunker, kind of a low. He should go down to this dragon punch. Dragon punch comes out. The dragon's looking for you. He finds it. Bunker's gonna go down. That frontliner is done, but Pacheco is gonna still find himself dead. The percentage is there, and the point pressure is there as well. But when you have this bridge right here, it is so hard to break this. Formation. Joseph even has to back up after two of his teammates go down. They're completely surrounded. Diggy's been holding this area the whole time and might even chase after Vex here. Runs coming back on this con. Chance to get overpowered potentially, but once he holds on, knows the shield has a chance to come out. This would be a good time to use it if you can find the angle. They could turn this to a 4-0 Ice Mines, which we never see, but this is VP's click pick. They're clearly comfortable on it. See how they decide to move in and change this around. Slow for now, but this card's getting closer, and VP need to make a move soon. 17 seconds, and you already see the pressure is trying to move up. Good shots from Cruncy, but he's not going to be able to find enough damage, especially when you have that healing. You have so much at your disposal, and the Rockets are just firing down from above directly on the Diggy. The shield goes up. Grumpy Bomb is also there. Two to one seconds to none. You have the Dome Shield used just as the last second reaches, and then you hear the Storm Sirens. They're coming out, but Vex with a good axe. Oh, it's the back. You're mine. The overpower is there. The Dread Server tries to get peeled, but it doesn't matter. Alex is just being steadily fired upon. They get rid of him. They get rid of Bunker. Diggy has to use the Assert Dome. He wants to stay alive, but a commander's grab is going to force him out. They have to body block him, but he finds his way right back into it. The combustible also out. They're just steadily firing directly at Diggy. As the gauge goes out, Dragon Punch is there just to make sure he gets on. Bunker drops down right into it. The overtime is done, and Furnace Pro with a 1 1 score are going to even it up against NIP. What a commanding response to the last game. It was very close. VP said, Well, that was your pick. This is ours. We know how to play Ice Mines, and they clearly showed it. 4 0, you never see that. But they played fantastically, I think. That combustible, huge deal, honestly. Michigan finding so many kills on Bonker, hiding behind his wall. People trying to hide around corners in a race, just being unkillable because they're all staring at fish. Well, I mean, you mentioned it before. I believe it was was that Gore mentioned it, but you have the combustible Drogos. Yeah. Pacheco knows those angles. Throughout this entire game, he has had so much pressure, being able to hit those shots, find what he needs to, and he could have been one of the single-handed people as to why VP won that. Yeah, and I think NIP need to stick to their bread and butter for now, especially on this stage. I think they want to they want to be playing that double off tank play. They want to be playing aggressively. They don't really want to be holding back. I mentioned they probably have to pull back right. to make it work, but it's just not what they want to do. They want to go in. You saw it when they were feeding in to try to kill fish, and they need to find a comp that can actually pull that off. Well, it's already looking like the last set, Envy versus Pittsburgh Knights was a really, really close game. This is, seems to be the same right after this break. We'll head right into game three. Rated Teen.
Welcome back, everybody, here to the main stage. All tied up at one apiece between Ninjas in Pajamas and Virtus Pro. My name is Pretty Hair, joined by Gormizer. We're guiding you through this one. What a response from Virtus Pro. I mean, we have not seen a lot of four O's today, and that was one hell of a show. And that's one of the things they always bring on Ice Mines. It's one of the few teams, I think, that has done it as consistently well as them. It was a great draft into great play from them. It was hard to counter out. I mean, there wasn't yeah. much opportunity you had to find a counter, even if Virtus Pro let out for a second. Uh, I think it speaks to exactly what we were talking about about this map earlier, is that it has evolved. It used to be you would come here when you wanted to slow the set down and you didn't want to get it blown out of the water. You, it was nigh impossible to get 4 0 here. But because so many teams started using that strategy, you had no choice but to evolve. Yeah. You had no choice but to get better. And now we have teams like Virtus Pro who will crush you on this map if you are not prepared. You get Dosups, Arrays, Vex. All of them only have one death. Arrays was 10 and 1. But honestly, I don't think that's where things began. Even though he was 11 and 7, I think Fisheko was just commanding an amount of presence. But it's really behind the scenes even further. It goes down to Vex. Vex is so damn good at Grover. I just don't yeah. know if you can control him on a map like this where Grover is excellent. You're not going to be able to keep him kind of controlled. You have to lock down. He's healing through walls. He had great whirlwinds. He knows the angles of where he needs to jump to heal through floors. Yeah, on you can see it. On this map, on Stone Keep, like, there's just so many times where he <laughs> is the savior. It kind of looks silly, right? On some, on yeah. that last kind of push when the conversion happened, you see Vex just kind of running into a wall, jumping. That's because that healing is going to persist up through the terrain yeah. and heal his teammate who is getting bombarded on the high ground. Incredible performance from Fischeko's Drogos. A yeah. lot of these, these dives with confidence that paid off, that get killed. And even at the very end, there was a, a nice dragon punch that he goes through. And so the target, I think, the that air. they were calling for dies in the process. He's off tank, and then yeah. he flies straight into an Anara who's dropping from the spawn. And it's just those moments, those calls, things that you only get when you know the champion as well as Fish Echo does. And that's the smooth gameplay you get from Drogos. Again, something we haven't really seen from a lot of teams no. lately. I'm excited to see the fact that they're still more than willing to pull it out. There was a lot in this game that we have not seen yet today. And I do want to touch again on what Vex was playing, how Vex was playing, right? You see this Grover on this map. It's yeah. an incredibly strong champion pick that we just didn't see in the previous game, in the previous semifinal when we saw the Ice Mines come out. Seeing it now, it's a completely new can of worms. I think both of these teams are playing different styles than what we saw earlier on today. I think we're in for not only an interesting second semifinal here, but one hell of a finals tomorrow. Well, and you have to think about the fact that when you look at these two, specifically in quarterfinals and how they got here, NIP had a little bit more of a struggle. They lost a couple games with the Renegades. Honestly, yeah. you could go through about game three, game four. You could probably have told me Renegades were winning that set. Sure. And I would have believed it. It was a shaky start. Virtus Pro 4 0'd Kanga, and it wasn't even a, a chance. Kanga just didn't exist in that set as far as Virtus Pro were concerned. This is a good map, though. Bizarre. Great for an IP. It gets them kind of back in the flow. Right. If they get off step, though, it is a very slippery slope downhill. Let's talk about what's happening here. I mean, look at Ascension Peak. Look how damn close that one. This set could easily be 2 0 Virtus Pro. Oh, yeah. The way that game two happened with such a landslide victory on Ice Mines, that's where I start to get concerned, right? This is where I think the coaches would come into play, right? Specifically Bees. He needs to keep these guys at an even keel, right? There is a lot of frustration potential, I think, in this NIP roster. And that was the biggest thing. The reason their first phase was so successful was they didn't... It was like, going well. It was kind of that... Well, it was going what well. What do you have to also, complain about? They were going to be like, well, yeah, you know what? We lost a map. Who cares? Let's just keep going. Like, we're, we're up either in score. We know we can do it. Then when they started losing, you saw it manifest in that moment of like, wait a minute, they're frustrated with each other. Like it's getting kind of heated up in the booth, in the studio. Now, of course, it would be in the crowd, but they have to kind of keep that level head as they go forward with it, like you said, because otherwise it all falls through their hands. And that's a lot that I think falls onto bees. Teams are defined by how they bounce back from these losses when everything's going great. It's, you know, it's easy breezy. You don't need anybody yeah. to kind of be that anchor emotionally for the team and get them through the tough times. Ninjas and Pajamas had nothing but good times. Definitely hit a slump in the second phase. Virtus Pro, anything but. They were white hot, ripping the league apart, seemingly just defeating everybody with ease to get them in the position they're in now. They were sixth place, barely made the cutoff to the midseason Invitational. 
obviously stripping that Penta team that did win that event of a lot of their talent and elevating themselves in the process to the point where they look like the hottest team for Phase 2 coming into this World Championship. And for some of it, you could see them kind of clawing their way up from six, but there yeah. were other times they were just is knocking everyone climb. out of their way. Like, they didn't yeah. care for a little bit there. And they kind of suffered the same thing NIP did. NIP took a break, they come back, and once they came back from that break, that's when they started losing. Virtus Pro seemed like they had done the same thing until we saw them last week. Everyone was kind of curious what team we were going to see out of them. And while well, right now they are more than comfortable, they get two picks here that I think are going to be very, very good for them. When you get Crunchy on something that he can just zone on, it makes the team's life so much easier. Anytime I see Bazaar, anytime I see some of these weirder maps, I'm starting to think NIP. They really put, I think, a lot of time in because they had such a good start. Remember, records didn't reset at the midseason yeah. Invitational. That means NIP, despite hitting that slump, they had a lot of time to workshop maps, new strategies, new ways to win and play the game. And I think they spent a lot of that time learning new maps, right? Getting Bazaar in their pocket, right? Getting Timber Mill, getting comfortable on some of these weirder places. And that's so good considering how many times we saw, even last year, when like Splitstone Quarry is a new map and teams just had to forcibly ban it out because they couldn't play it at the level they needed to. Instead, NIP are the ones saying, you know what, no, we're going to take you to the new map. We're going to make you learn it or we're going to guarantee ourselves a win here. Give us a lead. It's perfect for tiebreakers. It's perfect for seven games because there's just enough off maps for them that they've kind of mastered that I think give them such crucial turnarounds. I've got a good line of sight here on Virtus Pro in the back of their heads, drafting, kind of turning, chatting with each other. There's a lot of conversation happening, but ultimately it's a lot of smiles, some laughter. I think after a win like they just had on Ice Mines, you've got to be feeling good. And if you can continue that, you really put yourself in a good position to start to run away with this set. Look at how back and forth Pittsburgh and Envy was. The second Pittsburgh were able to break that rhythm and get the set in their favor, that was all it took. These semifinals, this final Finals. This is going to be a game of inches, razor thin margins. Minor mistakes are going to cost you big, so you need every advantage you can get. So you get that. I have a line of sight down onto to NIP, and Bird's over there in a 720p window. I <laughs> picks and bans. He goes full mind. screen for the game, and it's just so bizarre to me to see how they're they're going forward with the draft. But I mean, that's one of those things. Maybe it works for them. Maybe it's to make calls. Whatever's comfortable, baby. Works for them. They get cons. They get the Inara. I think they're very comfortable with this draft. Bird. I'm, been scared. Playing I'm a long worried. Time. I'm, they real can't good. see what I can see, but I'm worried right now. I'm looking at Virtus Pro. They're smiling. They're clapping. They are happy with what they got on Bazaar. This is into loser's pick, folks, right? This is ninjas in pajamas map pick, but we still have Virtus Pro down in their booth. They're clapping. They're feeling extremely good about what they just locked in. This map is going to come down to Fish Echo on Eevee, which is a scary thought going up against whoever it's on time. NIP is going to pick it up. Probably Alex on that Mave. Those two boxing it out, they're going to be the ones creating the space. They're going to be the ones that can win this for them. And admittedly, if I'm taking a bet on that, I'm almost always choosing for Sheko ZV. That's probably why they're so happy. That is just a, one of the tried and true provens of Paladins. Hey, man, I talked a lot about Pauly P's Eevee in the first set of the day. Unfortunately, it couldn't cut the mustard. Fischeko's is one lethal Eevee as well. One of the best, if not the best, to ever do it. Freeze God's not here to claim that title. So yeah. you got a point to Fischeko. You got a point to game three on Bazaar. It's time. just see this as a game seven. Unfortunately, we're not seeing that here. We're seeing this being used as sort of this pocket pick map, I believe, for NIP. We've seen them bring it out before, but this map is pretty intense. There's stuff happening all of the time. Yeah, and it's really open too, so not a lot of places to hide on the mid fight, honestly. Like, you gotta go behind the walls and there, but if you're watching the lower tunnels, there's really nowhere that's safe, so anybody that can either do a lot of damage across the map or cross a lot of distance very quickly is gonna be very valuable. Virtus Pro. Nick said they were happy with their draft, and I can see why. Leon, Ash, Barrett, all great on this map, and Bunker back on this Inara, trying to get aggressive, but already low and has to kite to the point. Ooh, Diggy's gonna go down in the very first minute and five seconds of the game. They got rid of one of the frontliners, and now there's only one of them remaining, and three other worried members of VP that have to back off and away from this engage they might actually have. Their shots from Diggy, they're putting on this pressure, but 42% for NIP already, and they are putting on the pressure and making sure that BP don't have their opening. Sheko's playing this pretty well though, constantly kiting away from whatever angle they're peeking. Both tanks 
actually pretty low on NAP's side. They need to spread some heals around. Ice block, blanket bunker, a moment of respite because Fish can't shoot him, but Fish is still going in for the kill. Already, Diggy's low on the right side, used the battle shout, but still wants to keep on that pressure. He's gonna have to back up or at least rotate around, but he is in a very, very bad spot. But I mean, Pacheco's just rotating around. He's blinking in, blinking out, using that wormhole to make sure he is in a good enough spot. The presence goes right into the battle shout, so the con's not gonna take any damage. Finally contesting the point though. VP got a little bit of time. Ice Block forced again. I don't know where Fish can go, but looks like Tenor doesn't connect the shots actually as he backs away. Body blocking the con out. Diggy kind of caught going back and forth. But they need to touch the point now or it's over. They were actually able to. Joseph's already on there with them as the Barrett. The Ice Storm gets dropped, but the Dresser made even better for Bird to peel for himself. They take care of him and Vex goes down as well. Looks like Ash is going to be the next one on the menu and she is. Overtime done. NIP one point on Bazaar. You can see how confident they are on this map, even with the draft that, other than the con, I mean, I honestly would give the edge to BP, but NIP did not look faltered at all. Great control over it. Not a single death on the board for them. Crunty already having died three times. And this is, I would say, one of Ash's best maps, but NIP practiced this map a lot. It's been something they always take teams to in sets. Why that's working out for them so far. There's tons of practice. Tenor pushing on the side. Micah dope by a race, but this midnight's gonna peel him out. Time of space does, does not find any marks whatsoever from Vex. Alex is gonna take care of him, and so is Bittner. He's gonna make sure he takes care of that one-on-one. -on -one. He was just happy with the race, but even better, stun directly onto Pacheco. A double for Bird. The support is there, and he is hungry for some kills. A nice emote as they're pushing in the cart. A minute and 40 still remaining for NIP. Bird better be feeling himself. He saved himself from the EV. Got perfectly saved by Diggy on that con. So much team potential saving with that battle shout heal. Now backline diving Bird again. Is that even the play at this Ooh. point? Pacheco goes down to Alex. Nice job waiting to watch for the wormhole. He's actually able to get those daggers. Leon's looking next on the menu. A void grip goes up, but a raise goes down. Joseph's managing to actually contest this on the cart. Bittner is still there, but he's gonna get taken care of too. They are steam rolling into a second point for NIP to nothing for Virtus Pro. BP just didn't have any of the answers to what they wanted. They kept thinking they found the target, but Damba is so hard to dive, especially in the early game when you don't have that resilience. His reload stuns you. Dread Serpent fears you, that ultimate, so much that he can do to keep himself alive, including the intangibility on Slither that also cleanses Cauterize. By the way, when you use that dash, if he's in a Gord, he'll get the maximum amount of healing that he would have otherwise. And you can see right here, shouted at the last moment. Hasn't caught one from the damage, but he couldn't find anything else. And honestly, I think these tanks on DP need to find something. Crunzi got that one kill on Tenor, but one in five, oh and three. I think they need to they need to make a little bit more room. Fish is in and out, but he's never able to find a kill to finish. This is looking rough for Virtus Pro, man. I mean, they're all negative. They're trying to build these resills. They're trying to build resilience to make sure they are CC'd less, whether it be fear, whether it be stun, or whatever the case is, to make sure that Mazamba has less and less value as the game goes on. But Virtus Pro, 23%. You mentioned it before, Chris. Like the comeback mechanic is available. The overpower goes through. They find Joseph. They take care of him. Blink onto the point. It's not up, but the... the a certain dominance goes straight right back down. 15% to 23, the Ice Storm, but the Dread Serpent to follow through, and they're able to kill Pacheco because of that. The certain dominance could have found more, but I think they just weren't looking at the right things afterwards. Tenor goes down to Crunchy, and he's still holding this area. The overpower spent was pretty good. Vex actually kills Bunker on the side, and they might lose Bird as well. Vex and Crunchy, they got one kill apiece. The clock strikes at midnight. You can't see anything, but Vex with the movement. He's able to move in, move out, not get hit by any daggers. 36% for NIP to 35, and Alex is gonna go down. Comeback mechanic available as well as through time and space. I think he might be able to go down here if VP are aggressive enough, but Tenor's peeling the left angle. They have someone else watching the right. No real way to get them off of him, and Tenor might actually go down himself, trying to save him. So low, Bunker now desperately going in. This body block, oh, oh save nice. him in the last second. They don't actually let him move in. Anara, one of the slowest moving characters in the game, gets body blocked by Barrick. Does not allow her to touch for overtime. And now, look at this. VP, they are turning this situation on dead, on its head right now with being able to capture one point and continue this push. Comeback mechanic definitely helping them. Did give NIP really a great chance for a retake, and that's why comeback is so impactful as the games go on. I mean, Mike had a they have a stagger on Dope, but he actually trades out for Bird, so that's not the best thing you'd be hoping for here. Dope trying to get away 
Just not make it out in the end. And Fish actually might go down trying to save him here. Not sure if it's worth saving the stagger targets, but at the very least, VP's still moving the payload. Arrays has to move back, but the overpower, where you're going, brings them right back in, and they're able to get that pick. Now NIP are able to push forward and fight back as the card was moving for Virtus Pro, but a good boy grip. They're just going to focus directly onto him. They want him to go down, and he does. They're all grouped up. The shoulder bash is available. He might use the assert dominance. He's going around in the back. He's going to try and move in. They don't see him. They don't know that he's behind directly. They get rid of those steps, but they're back there. They're putting on that pressure, and they got the kill. They honestly were completely checkmated. NIP had no options there. If they all back up as a group, they all get a certain dominance. Go forward, die to all the damage. Great play by VP to keep them pincered and give them nothing that they could do. Tanks now rolling out towards the right, just waiting for their DPS. The card's gonna move for free for a little while, but this is a very difficult corner to overcome. That balcony above where Bittner is right now can be, you can spam from there to lock down the tunnel. You can go back into spawn at any time. Very safe there. And NIP don't want to play a safe, though. They want to go in and find fish. They do. They're waiting for the ice box. Bender actually lands a crossbow boat mid-air. Nice air shot from him to be able to take him down. But Crunzy, off-tank battle already said and done. A raise goes down as well. Two kills for NIP, but two in return for Virtus Pro. Vex is already there. He knows that Bird is already on the side. He's just waiting. Spreading out as much healing as he possibly can as Genos. Bird waiting in the mist. The wall goes up. They don't want to make sure that he can actually make his way back to the point. With 20 seconds still available, this round might possibly be over. Trades are just purely bad for Virtus Pro. You don't want to be trading back and forth because they'll get their spawns faster. You have to mount across the entire map to make it. No one's really getting master riding just yet. Look at this aggression again. NIP think they found the opening, pushing the side, but the real opening's gonna be walling off a race. Vex all the way in the back. He's got a few time in space, folks. He could snipe if he wanted to, or he might even try and save it a raise if Pacheco go down. So it looks like they might try and save their ultimate kinetic burst. Stalling as much as they can. Boy Grip goes up directly on a bonker, but they take care of Joseph. Vex right around the corner, but the overtime timer is ticking down. Now you've got a three to one on NIP's map pick. This could be it. They could break the tie and be up 2-1 against Virtus Pro. Still a tough mid fight to win though. VP have double comeback mechanic. They have every single ultimate. So much to work with if they want to make this happen. And I feel like they're, they might be finding the answer to what NIP want to do. NIP kind of ran the same strat a couple times in a row, trying to constantly push through that back gate. It kept working because they need to pull a little bit further back, play their range, play the fact that EV can counter aggression a little bit more, maybe hold her close, hold the back line back. A lot of things you can think about, a very deep strategic game. So they build some things like that, but they may, may mostly they just need to stop Phalanx. Tenor was the star in the earlier games, but 12 and 3 right now for him. Getting out damaged, but he knows how to follow up on what Tenor's doing. Yeah, we're gonna have to see what Vex might try and pull out. He has the three time in space. He can go for an early snipe or he can reserve to save it. Regardless, the point percentage is in Virtus Pro's favor. They still have comeback mechanic as well. The overpower goes out, but it actually does, it actually just ends up missing. Bonker though gets the kill directly on a Pacheco. Alex throwing out those daggers. The assert dominance was used. He's in the back line trying to pick up those kills, but everyone's stacking on point. They want to fight Dosim. They take him down with 6% on NIP's side. They only have one ultimate up, almost two in the form of overpower. So four ults for VP though, and then IP used three ultimates to get negative 46% cap time because VP held it the entire time. Now moving back in, Crunzy on the left could get overpowered, so they need two people to go into touch at the same time. Maybe try to find a time and space, but they don't really have a real combo for it. Yeah, they're looking for it. The time and space goes wide, doesn't find its mark, but they take care of Alex. Vex and Pacheco go down. The wall goes up. Don't They don't really have much really left at all. They have the ultimates, but one of their tanks went down. They had the dome shield, but nothing still. Crunzy, all he's doing is buying time for his tank bait to come back. 81% to 66, to 90, to 93, to a potential point capture for NIP, but they're gonna wait for just a little bit longer. Pacheco got the overtime, blinking over. Dome might have a chance to come in, and he still has dome shield. He might get burst through it, though, but the bowling ball saves him at the last second. He's actually able to use it to keep himself alive for a little bit longer. They get Pacheco on the side, a race, Slides up, Dosa's looking really low. Bender rotates right back around. Overtime still ticking down. They got rid of a raise. Overtime is still there because Crunchy's on the point, but it doesn't matter because two to one for NIP, and that's gonna be the tiebreaker. They have completely flipped around from last game. I love watching NIP when they're playing at this level. 
You saw those last moments when it was just the tank and a raise alive. Every single member of NIP, laser focused, locked in, chasing down that Leon. They were all just staring dead at him. Then immediate focus turn. That is a team that's playing like a machine. And after that last game, that's surprising. That's a, that's a hell of a mental comeback. Yeah, I mean, you have to be able to bounce back from situations like this. I mean, that's pretty much, I mean, this is it, man. I mean, you're at the highest caliber of play that you could possibly yeah. be at right now. You cannot mess around. You have to be able to bring out all these stops, even if it's one of your, really your back pocket map picks like yeah. Bizarre. And honestly, if it keeps going like this, if each team keeps winning each other's maps, then NIP win the set, right? Right, well, so I mean, yeah. If NIP yeah. keep winning their own maps, they have the lead right now, two to one. A lot for VP to come back from, but a lot of maps left to go. Was looking good for NIP, but I'm sure Virus Pro got some fight still left in him right after this break. We'll be right back into the next game. <laughs> I was looking for this. Come and get it. Son of a... I like you. Welcome back to the Alienware Consortium of Analytical Authority. Me and Gormizer here, but unfortunately, that doesn't require too much analyzing. Another landslide victory for NIP. Yeah, I, I said before we got in the game, it was going to be, is Maeve going to do good? Is Eevee going to do good? And Fish Echo didn't show up. He was kind of shut down the entire yeah. time. On the other side, that Maeve, the last time I remember looking at a slash line, was 9-2. and two. <laughs> seem to be hitting too many issues. I think, uh, you know, once we kind of get into the post-game stats and can kind of see what the numbers can tell us that was a, a virtually didn't even show up performance from a raise man he seriously struggled that time oh yeah nine Ooh. has to turn around for virtus pro a Which lot of goose eggs in the first round right cruncy was the only one with a kill through the first round we're talking goose egg and three right oh and four some oh and threes across the board really scary stuff in the first round that type of dominance that type of of performance for NIP, Gormizer usually leads to a big item advantage, which isn't something that really comes up often, but when yeah. it does, it can be brutal to play through. And that's one of those things you don't think too much about, but the credits in the game, once once you start getting those items online, like a yeah. tier two record versus a tier one, it changes the game. Tier three versus tier two, again, changes the flow of the game. Huge power spike. And when you're looking at it, I mean, you have one and 10 on your EV, an 0 and 9 going I feel in. bad. I Four. talked it up. <laughs> I thought it was going to be It's a 1 and 10. It's one of the like few consistencies that we've had is Pacheco is good on EV in that game. It Listen, did yeah. not happen. You got to give a lot of credit to Bird as well. He was the recipient of a lot of that early pressure from the EV. He did. But he is care. so cool, calm, and collected under that pressure. He's been there so many times before against Bugsies, right? Bird's played against Pacheco's mentor, right? He has seen all the tricks. The second that Eevee's in range, she's getting Dread Serpent and gunned down by Maldamba. I mean, that was an incredible performance from every single member of NIP. And I think it's those types of firing on all cylinders, levels of play that lead to these landslide victories. And it's amazing to see, I guess, like uh, Grace under pressure like that, right? When you're already down one, you know this is your map. You have that amount of control. But yeah. there's something different about being able to say like, oh man, there's an Eevee on me again. I guess I'm just going to dread serve. And like, yeah. no, like nonchalant, didn't care anything about it. Otherwise, you would have someone maybe panic. Maybe they misplaced their ult. Maybe they aren't being able to find the shots right afterward or a stun right afterward. Verge was able to kind of maintain control over that one. Of course, I don't know how much he needed to. After a while, they just started slaughtering the DPS from VP. They couldn't get back to him anyway. 
very, very calculated performances, I think, from Bird from support. He does a good job staying rotating with the team as well, making sure that he's shoulder to shoulder with the guys that he needs to keep alive. Yeah. But also not too concerned with being dope, right? Sometimes you you almost watch him playing and it's like he knows that he's dead here and he's just not even acknowledging it. He's trying to leave it all out on the field, throw out his gourds, get as many people mending serpented or mending spirited up as possible. We're headed to Frog Isle now for game number four. Losers pick, remember, so Virtus Pro have chosen to come here. And immediate bans coming out. A little bit of a switch up though. NIP leaving open We're Atlas. There started. might have been one, but I don't think there was a single set through the qualifier week where Frog Isle wasn't banned. Everyone was getting rid really? of it. Now we've gotten it twice in one day. I mean, we had got, kind of come on, commented on it, but at a certain point in phase two, we just decided that people didn't want to see the map. Like I couldn't remember the last time you had casted it for a long time or when oh, yeah. I had gotten to see it, it just disappeared from the flow. And it's because of what I assume we might see. What we got earlier was kind of an anomaly. A 3-3 on Frog Isle doesn't happen that often. 4-0, much more likely to happen. It's usually a snowballing map, very steamrolly. You Stay get the point, you move pretty much right into their base, and you just zone them until you convert, and then you try to do it again the next round. This is Virtus Pro's map selection, however. It's a long time ago, but you got to quote it. This is where Game 7 happened for Bird and Bonker at the yeah. first ever pa Paladins Invitational, where they were crowned the first ever World Championship, awarded their rings, and cemented in history. Now. Looking at these bands, you see the snipers, we see Makoa, and Nara is banned out to leave Atlas open. Obviously a second pick, that's to get Barrack and Khan. Is that worth surrendering Atlas? At the end of the day, I don't think so. I think he brings such a huge presence that it's, I don't want to say unmanageable, but it's difficult to lock down. The only reason I can think NIP are willing to do it is because out of the two, it's the lesser of two evils, right? Makoa on this map, I think, is a lot more of a nuisance yeah. than Atlas. This is one of the few maps where if you let Atlas through, it's not the end-all be-all. And they must have a way to manage it. They must know what they're doing. I think Barrick is one of the best, especially with Anara off the board, is the best point tank that you're going to have. Khan controls ramp like no other. Ash may be second to him, but it's going to be a little bit of a leap between them. With him and a Maeve behind it, that ramp control is going to be easy. I think mid-fight really is heavily kind of NIP favored right now. Kruntzi really one of the only uh, flickers of light in the darkness, I think, on Bazaar for Virtus Pro. A lot of goose egg slash lines like we yeah. mentioned through the first round. He had the only kill, but then he brought it back to being even. He went from being one and seven to eight and eight. Like, uh, that's a big round from him, only overshadowed by the fact that he got obliterated in the first round. However, game? I think you do leave Atlas open, right? You're kind of calling the bluff, right? You're almost putting that pressure and daring them to do well on it, right? Because if you don't, after picking a power tank, right, that is a huge hole in your draft that you can't recover from. And you find yourself in this awkward situation. I mean, you've got Atlas and Ash. Both of them aren't necessarily so known for standing playing, on right? the It's kind of yeah. ambiguous. And if you want to go ramp, I'm sending Ash over there. You have the perfect amount of knockback that you can get insta-kills off the edge of the map. That's where you want it to be. I Something honestly want gonna... to see Crunzy on the Ash more than I think I want to see him on the Atlas which would give Josephs the Atlas. It makes it a little bit weird style of play, but a lot of people go for your giant stasis field here. They go for that Temporal Divide. And when they have Temporal Divide, it makes it a little bit easier to withstand some of the onslaught of damage. But like I was saying during the cast earlier, it's only up for five seconds at a time. You really have a short window to work with. Gore, I'm kind of, it's, it feels like VP have a foot in, in and out of the door, right? They have two yeah. pretty aggressive tanks, right? Temporal divide that bad boy up, start moving across the map. You have your Io, you have your Ash, but then you have these two backliners. Not to say they can't get in there and mix it up, but I would say 60, 70% of that gameplay is kind of chilling out in the back line. And I think a lot of it is it's going to be interesting to see how they can kind of adapt to it. Temporal Divide, it's going to be on Crunzy this time around, so it's, it's going to be interesting to see what they can do. Let's get into it, folks. Frog Isle, NIP versus VP. So here's my question to you, Kresnik. So you're playing Paladins, of course, a game we all love. As you do. As you do, right? Uh, and you ban one of the power takes. You get rid of Makoa. NIP decides not to do that, and VP get the Atlas, and they get Io. Does their draft seem to you like they have a plan against it? Would you not be worried? If they took Victor, I think I'd be a little more confident in their gameplay against right. the Atlas. But Leon Maeve, it's all right. It's Atlas. It's, it's definitely not game-changing. I don't think it's a, it's a hard one matchup for sure. And I think VP are very happy to have ended up with that Atlas after banning Makoa. 
Jekko. Already dangerously low on the right side. The stationary combo is working out, but here comes the divide. This could be the start of the aggression. Already goes up, and you already see it. Luna dropped right on that point. And actually, Ash tries to shoulder bash her way out, but she's being kept alive. That DR is so much, but not when you have a good couple daggers coming off from Alex to finish off that kill. But look at the point difference. 48% to nothing. Now NIP can finally step foot on the board. That's the power of Luna. Always getting cap time, no matter how aggressive that you are. And they accidentally left her on top of the rock, I think, they're trying to pull back. Maybe that's just to do some extra damage, but Pacheco staggered out by this aggressive danger push from Alex. And now they have to be careful. If they die, they won't have a chance to have a tank back up to touch the objective. Finally, the disengage comes in, but they already gained the space back. We're just broke out what they wanted. Yeah, 48% once again is all BP have managed to got really to get. And NIP have yet to actually make themselves or well, force themselves off of the point. Now BP have found their opening. Now they're able to put on this pressure, but you get a raise already dead. He's already killed. And now Dosip being pocketed by that IO. The DR is there, the snake bite comes out, and you find another pick onto Doe. And now you're making your way back to the point with another kill or potentially on the Crunchy. Crunchy lives a long time, but no one gets the overtime on BP's side. So NIP converted right under the nose, basically. Tenor picks up two, and now Stagger potentially will begin a race trying to get away. He melted almost immediately when their last fight started. And Bonker, Bonker must have started Bulldozer because he's doing a lot of damage to Luna from all the way back there. Very, very good disengage, both from a race, causing that big game already available. And yep, you mentioned the Bulldozer president. Bonkers already has it and plenty of credit on the NIP side. Can't really say the same for BP. The Fake Light being one of the last bastions of hope they want to be able to have to try and find their momentum. Pacheco gets that kill. Flutters right back up. Bird's already in the back line. Flutters his way out, but a double kill already for Pacheco. Now he's looking at Bonker. He's making sure he gets it, and he gets a triple kill already, opening the door for Virtus Pro. Definitely helping them stop that stagger and get this aggressive defense. All that matters here is time. They want to zone them out as long as possible, make them use resources. That's the power of pushing to the enemy spawn. You make them feel so much pressure, they might make some decisions they're not happy with after the fact. Right now, though, Diggy trying to push this side and this midnight first ultimate spin. Is that going to be the only one just to get out of the spawn doors? The clock strikes midnight. That's what they wanted. They're able to push right back up. But the Deja Vu actually is a good one. Going right out. They try to use that rewind, but a raise gets that kill. So many are low. The overpower comes out as well, but it misses. It goes wide. Bittner trying to pincer them all into one area, but he's already back on the cart. He actually uses the enlightenment as well. Fires a shot, another one into Vex, and you got yourselves a pick and the ability to be able to fight back with a double from Bittner. Great flank by him. Also got cap pressure that whole time, and that is worst case for BP. When you lose a fight on defense, sure, that's fine. As long as you're always contesting the payload and not letting it get closer. But Tenor gets even more distance, and that limits the amount of fights that BP is going to be allowed to take. They can only fight as long as that payload cards lets them. 30 seconds left right now, though. And I'm in a good position. They might fight Fish to start. Diggy Dog and Bidner, the two of them fighting one kill apiece. But Luna right around that corner, they're trying to stall for as long as they possibly can, but it's not enough. Didn't even get the chance to drop it directly on the point. Vex has to retreat directly back into his base. One to none for Virtus Pro. And it's about to look like two to none for NIP with the dome shield and overpower. They've got two ultimates up still. Hopefully Virtus Pro can fight back. That quick turn by Tenor really just opened the door for them for sure in those last moments. Using enlightenment for damage is not really the first thought of a lot of Leons normally using it for that finish. You want to get that 50% refund that you gain by finding the kill with enlightenment, Leon's ultimate. Instead, use it for damage. Mm. Manage to clean up a lot of the members of the team. You don't need all the kills. Don't need the glory. Knowing that is so important as a DDS. And the suspicious triple kill that started VP's pretty solid defense, but for their sake, unfortunately, wasn't something they could follow up on. Yeah. I mean, look at the slash lines on NIP. Alex, undying, 6-0, 7-1 oh, for Bidner. Bidner, top of the damage charts as well. 0-2, Pacheco being the only one that's broke, even really on Verdes Pro's side. Everyone else struggling to try and find a foothold. Oh! Great start to that fight. Nice! Power onto Doe. Doe's almost like a reverse bonker, where I feel like his off tanks haven't been the best, and bonkers is the other way. Alex. Kiting away in the last moments, has the oh blast man. back, but Fish can't find the next confirm. He cannot <laughs> at all. Now big focus fire, or at least change. Oh, the bunker, but he fell off the side! He actually fell off the side of the map! He used the dome shield, and now he doesn't have an ultimate to actually fight back! 7% to 15 already! Virtus Pro, now they have their zone! 
that's not the bonker frog isle i expected to see in a world championship for sure loses the dome shield and goes back that might bite them the suppression from vp can Ooh, help nice. solidify this but diggy trades out fish and now i think NIP might have another shot he's still able to get that kill very, very well done from Fuscheco, man. I mean, trading out one for one, making sure that he goes down, kicking 78%. The clock strikes midnight, and now that's going to be NIP, NIP's chance to try and make their way in. The divider went out as they were retreating to make sure they didn't go down. VP backup, though, it's smart. There's not a lot of cap time for NIP. They can take their time, but this trend circuit might not give them that luxury, but it doesn't find anything. It doesn't. The rewind, once again, on the Alice on, side, on the side, Crunchy staying alive, throws out the core, tries to keep that healing luna just being a turret right now throwing out as much as she possibly can as well as keeping that pressure on him for shekels all the way over there but a good shot from bittner directly in the trees vex is gonna find the kill on a diggy but this point fight is not over yet he's still on it luna's there as well the stun follows alex all the way outside of it 87 percent to 99 nip with a good stun from bird and they're gonna be able to actually get that kill and the overtime is available i don't think they're gonna be able to go in for it really it's just gonna be giving them ult or ace try but he's oh, a cast too squishy. Work. And NIP are going to go 3 0 on Frog Isle. Absolutely insane. The return to form from NIP from the very end of the split to the quarterfinals to now throughout qualifiers is looking absolutely phenomenal right now. Dosim's charges in, tries to give himself some DR, but actually ends up getting killed immediately thanks to the Street Justice main. Pressure right now from NIP, cleaning up arrays. Might clean up Vex. Luna trying to save them, and this is her dominance. Trying to save a little bit, but it's just, I think it's just, oh, died actually. The sound for playing on the side, not sure what the stun was, but still now NIP holding strong. Both dismounts on the side. BP now can't really choose their positioning to take this fight. They want to be able to move in. They want to fight. That's what they want, but can they do it? Is the question of Bernard's pro side. You already heard the midnight. Maeve gets rewounded back to where she was before, but already a good assert dominance to the back line. He's on the healer. Crunchy's able to get that kill. Now they can turn stuff around. Tries to land the air shot, but he's out of range. Now they take care of Alex as well. The dome shield gets dropped directly in there. Both tanks already putting on so much pressure, but VP are able to fight back. One of the downsides of having Io is if someone's really, really low, you can't really stack with them. Luna has a mind of her own. She's thirsty for blood and is not going to give them any chance to buy any more time. A couple ultimates up for VP, and they're going to need to spend them if they want to have a chance to survive in this game. 3 0 up. NIP, the next capture of either the payload or the point, will win the game, VP. So life on the line. Overpower. It's going to be a great start for NIP to close it out. That's what they want, but you already heard it. You're out of time. He's looking for the exile. He's looking for what he can, but can he find anything when Alex is on a tail right now in the back line? They find the kill on him as well. Bird is able to clean up Joseph, and now Trunzi goes down. You've got a full on team wipe with 40 seconds left for NIP. Yeah, I was stunned about a little bit of time, but not enough, Alex. Unstoppable, more or less, at the moment. Currently pushing the spawn. Hits the daggers on fish. This fake light potentially could go down right away. They have the answers to it. He has to immediately cancel it because of the pressure from Tenor. 30 seconds remaining. The Dread Server goes out. The Divider was there, but it gets eaten by the Divider. They aren't actually able to be feared because of that. Now they swap targets on a bunker. Look at Luna. She's like a missile. She's going around in the back line and able to actually get that stun. 15 seconds left, and Virtus Pro look like they are able to defend this against NIP. The Dread Serpent actually didn't get eaten. I want to shout a bird, he detonated it right before the stasis field. But because of the positioning, it wasn't able to reach anybody. So still, good both ways. No touch potential for NIP right now. So VP do get the first point on the board of Frog Isle. But there's still a road to climb for this for sure. The, the mid fights have kind of just been in NIP's favor. They got a retake that I didn't think they were even expecting to be able to get. Yep. The aggression that they had. There's some ultimates that VP have, but I feel like NIP just keep having all the answers. Yeah, they've got to be able to fight back one to three. NIP, man, like I said, they are on a tear. What can you do against this? How do you try and fight back against this, Krezik? I mean, it is two to one right now in set points, but it is three to one in terms of game. What do you do even with comeback mechanic available? I'm not sure. I think they need to wait to pounce potentially, but you have to be aggressive with Ash yeah. Atlas. If you have the IO, the whole point of your composition is you go in, maybe wait for someone to get a little overzealous, but how do you catch out a Leon with Enlightenment yeah. and a Maeve that can just dash away with damage reduction? There's so much in the kits to keep them alive. 
They need to find something out of this Temporal Divider. NIP's gonna have too much of an aggressive chance. Already the Midnight gets used again as NIP are steadily making their way forward. Joseph has to charge right back out, but a good Street Justice. The execution is there. They're putting on so much pressure. Nice daggers from afar from Alex. A triple kill to be able to follow that up as well. Alex is absolutely on a tear on this Mave with NIP 3-1 against Virtus Pro. Alex definitely feels like he has someone to prove. Been a relatively quiet player all season, I think, kind of letting Tenor take the limelight, but this is his time for sure going into this set against BP. Right now, though, the body blocks have to come in. They have to find some way to stop the retouch from Virtus Pro. No overpower. Fake Flight might open something up, and they're close to a certain dominance, so they have a chance. They just have to get some kind of objective pressure, and they have to get it now. NIP are waiting for their opportunity. They're backing off. They're not over aggressive, and the Be Gone actually gets used to force them all the way back. Man, just to hit that wall right there, right next to the point, but they're gonna have to back up. The alignment goes out, but once again, the Assert Dominance was there. They use that. They use the Dome Shield as well right there. They're able to get the kill into a raise, but is it really worth it? He's already low. Vex gets the kill as well. 99% for Virtus Pro, and a kill on Bonker. Now they're now they're looking great. Now they're looking like they have a fighting chance while focusing on all cylinders right now. Overtime is available, but Virtus Pro with a clutch defense against NIP. As we get further into late the late game, I think the benefits of Io over Maldamba in a late set are gonna keep showing. Io, yeah, her heals are, are worse as the game goes on, just like every other healer, because of the presence of cauterized. It's an anti-heal item for those of you who don't know. Levels up 30, 60, 90 as you go on. But Io can also give damage reduction. That's so good in these late, crazy fights when your healing doesn't really matter. So, tries to get a little bit too much aggressive. Gets taken down by the Street Justice, and NIP might have finally stabilized this, this halfway pushed card from BP. Yeah, I mean, they were firing on all cylinders, just like we were saying, Chris. It is absolutely phenomenal for Virtus Pro to be able to fight back and clutch that team fight, just like they did. The divider goes out round of Pacheco, throws him right down into the water, and you're gonna be able to take care of him. One of your damage dealers is down, two of them, and now a point tank, or at least one of the off tanks, the power tank, is gonna go down as well. But already with a game pause for Virtus Pro, something is wrong, but still they are looking phenomenal despite it being two to three. This is gonna be great for NIP though. They're gonna be able to go very far with this because of how clean that was. They got three kills immediately, one after the other. Now they're gonna be able to take the ground, more than likely stop at the top of the stairs of danger, which is the cliff side for those who don't know, hold the main, and then just keep an eye on the window. If you have both of those angles locked down, no one's really gonna be able to get through Either way, every single angle is covered. Unless you have some character that can float under the map on the sides, there's no real way for VP to slip by. They do have potential to burst through double off tank plus IO. Throw IO somewhere to stun to protect their healer more than likely without the objective pressure being a factor. And then just have your off tanks shove one angle and protect the other. That's going to have to be how VP breaks out of this. But for now, NIP, they look like they're in a good position to hold this point for now. But you can't win the game off of a defense. Right. You have to capture the point or convert the payload. There's no other way to end the game when you're at three points. You have to do something. You can't win by letting the other team mess up. Yeah, you have to have that presence of mind to be able, like you were saying, it's three to two, but if NIP are able to defend, they do not win the game. You cannot win off of a defense. You can't turtle and just try and find that opening for you. But hopefully, they are able to continue pressing forward. VP are looking good with their ability to be able to fight back in the way that they did, and hopefully they can make it work for them. We'll see how VP end up holding this. Actually, NIP still being aggressive, but Diggy might be a little overzealous here. Gets pretty low. The shout doesn't do too much for him, and two people immediately go down for NIP. Nice. Diggy goes down as well as Alex. You already see that they're pushing in the spawn, being extremely aggressive. The rest of them just sort of going to make their way to point. I mean, they're already low in the back. They want to get a head start directly on that, and they're staggering out Barrick. That's why he's not dead yet. They want to stagger out the respawn timers to make sure he is not already back with his team. He's actually getting passive regen. He might be able to be a threat in the back. I think they thought he was going <laughs> to jump, but oh, it looks like finally they've decided to deal with him back. What a massive stagger. He's the biggest person to delay. Yeah. I don't know if the Khan can live that long. Shadow only buys him so much time, and he's already getting pressure to spawn. The divider goes out. Alex, once again, throwing out these daggers, maneuvering in a way that doesn't allow him to die, or at least allows him to get more damage onto the enemy team. You've got four ultimates up, a potential fifth in the works for Virtus Pro. NIP only have two, and they're still trying trying to build it up. Luna right around the corner. They're just positioning her just in case they need her as well as to be that turret that they need. The 20 seconds still remaining. It's just a matter of who will be the first ones to crack under this pressure. 
might actually be VP. Io struggles at spreading heals around, unlike Maltamba, so they need to find a way to keep everyone healed back up. Crunty taking a lot of fire. Oh Doe still low, and they can't keep everyone alive. And Crunty Five. and Fish both go down. Five seconds Three, remaining, two, and they have to one. back up. That's going to allow NIP to once again defend, but it is not over. Virtus Pro, two to three. If they can show what they sh what they ended up showing that round, then they could end up tying this up and potentially winning against NIP. Really comes down to what ultimates I think they use. Five ults versus five ults. You can't always rely on Bonker just falling off the map when he uses Dome Shield. That was definitely right. a one in a million kind of situation for MVP. And they still lost that mid fight, by the way, even with that yeah. happening. So they need maybe even more than that if they want to be able to turn it around. Potential, if anything, you want to try to find also value in the ultimate that maybe you don't normally see. Something out of the exile, something out of the be gone. We know a certain dominance, Scout and Fate Flight are all good. But if you are uh, getting a great exile or a great be gone is very different. A lot of supports nowadays use the damage immunity from be gone to kind of peel for themselves. Keep them alive as long as possible if they get dove. It's just a response to pressure. But this is Frog Isle. There are cliffs everywhere. This entire map is a giant hazard. There's a whole call out on the map that's just danger. Right. You can definitely find something with it if your team sets it up right. Yeah, and that's the question of will they actually be able to set up right? Now, the game is paused right now, I'm taking some time to actually get back into it. But I'm glad you mentioned that, Kresnik. Like you said, Frog Isle, uh, pretty much one big hazardous map. You can really fall off at any time. And so that's what makes characters like Makoa so strong. You've got those hooks you can yeah. position in ways that will allow him to hook somebody off the map. You have to be careful when you're standing next to him. That's why they banned him along with him just being a good tank. And that's why they want to be able to take care of that tank for sure. Yeah, it's also for, for the Makoa ban thing. It's also what we saw G-Bunny doing in right, the last exactly. set. Being that's what I was saying. Straight up danger. Use the Ancient Rage in the back line. But He's out of it. They got the Atlas instead. And I, I don't know if VP had been using the Temporal Divide to its fullest potential. I think it's great when you can split a team or punish someone that's over aggressive, but that NIP team really isn't interested. Right. Of course, in the issue, especially into double tank, they know that they're going to get an opportunity if it's given to them. You're going to have to give it to them when you have two tanks that kind of thrive on being so aggressive. Well, I mean, you were saying that the divider was being used. Well, you feel like it's not being used to its full potential. You were mentioning how yeah. they should be using it to try and get picks and such. Then where should they stand? Where should they be positioned? Where can we expect Cruncy to be at if that's what they're looking for, to be aggressive like that? He is, I think he's peeking a little bit too much on stage and getting that shield forced out. I think it's the bigger thing. Maybe flip. So in Crunzy, that way Ash has a shorter distance to travel, to shoulder bash into the back line. And Crunzy can kind of use the statue, the trees, as cover from Bittner, who I think has been a massive difference maker in this game so far. I agree with that. We already see we have the Wrecker threes, the Cauterized threes, reduces the amount of healing you have, breaks those shields as well. But two to three, this is danger. This is what Crescent was talking about. You can see why. Literally living right on the edge. Two to three, tries to use the enlightenment, goes for a long range shot. Okay, Bender, I understand. You're good, but I wouldn't try and do that once again because since you use that ultimate, the rest of them are trying to be able to move up and put on this pressure. Luna goes down though, but Bender, I mean, at this point between him and Alex with a double apiece, they are the ones in control of this point. 18% for NIP and three ultimates still up. I used four ults, got basically nothing. NIP in total control here with an overpower and a dome shield. That's going to be so impactful at keeping them locked down, getting rid of whoever's going to touch. Scout comes out, still makes you see CMU, and this is still the previous patch right now, so that is an answer to the overpower. Fish coming in, I think he thinks he had to touch, might have been a little early. Holds back, both tanks go in, but they have to walk into a dome shield. The dome shield is there. The dagger's coming out from Alex as well. Arrays, he is on the side. Big game damage, though. They actually take care of Alex on the side, which that's going to be really, really good. Dead zone gets dropped directly on the bonker. He already used the dome shield, so he has no more cover other than the shield he just used. Bender with a double. Arrays in the back line, wreaking havoc right now, and they're just stacking on top of him. But Fasheko moving in and out, you can't end up killing this man. 86% for Furnace Pro. Alex has to try and touch, but he can't. And three to three for Furnace Pro already. Shout out to Luna, capturing that point the whole time. And letting girl, play dude. around the corners. When you don't, when you're not forced to go to the objective, you have so many more opportunities in what you can take. You don't have to present yourself as a threat. You just make Luna do it, and as soon as they shoot her, then you take the, the advantage that you've been given. And I'm be now. But facing down what was a dominant map for them, completely turned on its head. EP basically tearing that map went away from them. They still have to convert this payload though if they want to. Alex getting forced out dangerously low. Fish locking down that side, but VP, they have to spread their heals. They're all taking a lot of damage. They have to slow things down. 
minute and 50 seconds remaining. They have to. I mean, they're all really low. He already flutters directly up into the air, and Shekel's just putting on as much pressure as he can as they're trying to enter in the spawn. They're forcing them all the way back. Luna is the one capping the point. It's slowly moving forward. Can really anyone make it back? You have the second chance available. You get rid of Bunker, and I cannot believe this with Furnace Pro fighting back as hard as they are, are making sure that they do not go down without a fight. Crunzi with the double. You have a kill with a Shekel. And look at this with Furnace Pro on the comeback and a 2-2 against NIP. Down 3-0 at the start, complete turnaround from Virtus Pro. Their draft really opened it up in the late game and they figured out what they had to from the other side. Pressure tenor as much as you can, force out those enlightenments, make him uncomfortable. You shouldn't feel like your best enlightenment is being thrown at a Faith Lightning Willow across the map. That's so much damage being put on. Complete flip and who is countering who. Right, I mean, you... <laughs> it was looking like NIP for a second, man. I mean, I really thought that that what was going to happen. But Virtus Pro, like you were saying, you can't put all that attention on a Faith Lighting Willow. I mean, Fasheko was doing really, really good with his ult usage. He was making sure that he was covering himself effectively. And because of that, Virtus Pro and the rest of them were able to clap back and make sure they tied this up. Yeah, that damage resistance actually made a huge difference, I think, in that final really, really clutch fight. Keeping those DPSs alive when they were hiding. Also, IO heals you pretty quick when you do lose cauterize, even though the damage reduction gives you an advantage when you are being focused. You get topped off pretty quickly. Yeah. There's not a lot of people to heal. IO's heals really shine. Yeah, I agree with that too, man. I mean, that 25% damage reduction that she has, if she's yeah. just sitting there just healing you, providing as much as you possibly can, it's very, very hard to take those targets down. Once again, right after this break, we'll be right back into the next game at NIP versus Virtus Pro. All right, I'm here with Chris Larson, COO of hi -Res Studios and executive producer of Rogue Company. Yeah. And we got to talk a little bit with Gandhi about the game, but I just want to know, you know, what is Rogue Company? What exactly is the goal with the game? And how fun has it been working on it? Man, Rogue Company has been so great. We've um, been having such a great time with the game. Uh, it's a tactical action shooter, kind of a hybrid, um, and super fun. It's a true to life, um, true to life art style, which is very different than yeah. a lot of the other high res games. Um, so we've been like building the team, making sure that like we're really hitting that aesthetic that we want to hit. Um, we had uh, you can sign up at roguecompany.com uh, for Alpha, which we're going to start. We believe the 19th of December. Amazing. So people are going to yeah. be able to get their hands on it. Of course, if you're in the venue at any point this weekend, you can stop by and play. Yeah. And, I mean, tell me, like, what kind of game modes are we looking at? What, what exactly does the game have going for it? Yeah, we have two game modes right now, a 4v4 and a 2v2. Yeah. Um, extraction is the 4v4 game mode. And, um, you know, there's going to be a neutral objective. Uh, it's basically the first one to hack the objective or kill the other team. Yeah. And then we have a 2v2, which is more of like a free-for-all, um, which is really fun. Yeah, go yep. find your kills, do whatever you need to. Exactly, exactly. So I got to ask, do you, do you have an explanation like, for this? What is like, what this? What is this that's going on? So, we got hacked earlier on the red carpet. Yeah, so. we got hacked. Um, so we have a bunch of characters, lots of like very eccentric, uh, bigger-than-life personalities, and we have a character called the Hacker, and um, he'll have... I'm not sure what the kid is yet because he's not in the game, yeah. but we have some awesome concepts and it's it's gonna be fun and it should the hacker should be released into Alpha December or January. Well I'm excited to play him. I'm sure a lot of people will be again. Roguecompany.com yep. to sign up for the Alpha starting sometime in December as we go forward. Nice. I think he just got hacked once again. Got, yeah. We're gonna have to get out of here before they take the cameras down. Cheers. Welcome back to the main stage here at High res Expo. Pretty Hair and Gormizer here to break down an electric frog aisle. I mean, that looked like it was going to be another landslide NIP victory. But the turnaround, Virtus Pro digging their heels in the 3-2 scenario and make it happen. And that's the thing that, that is more flooring than anything, right? You're up 3-0. Like, you look so done with Frog Isle if you're NIP. 
losing that losing map it, yeah. from that point is probably more grueling than I think what it took to be able to come back and win it. Very well played from Virtus Pro, but you have to kind of take the fact that it goes up 2-2, but NIP are going to be feeling that one, I think, more than anything. Such a rough loss. That is a tough, tough loss for NIP. They were up so handily. Look at Alex's flash 24 and 9, 15 and 8 for Tenor. I mean, these are crushing numbers out of the gate. It looked like there was no stopping NIP, but there was this completely inverse relationship with how much pressure Tenor was able to put on Fischeko to shut him down. But the second that pressure let up, you saw Fishy just take over the game. And I think that's the biggest thing. You don't see crazy slash lines. You see Fischeko come through and get kills in crucial moments when the space was created for him. He's got a lot of damage to his name, but it wasn't anything out of the ordinary other than just good team play coming down from Virtus Pro. They recognized what was kind of leading to their defeats in the first couple of rounds and, like you said, claw their way back, essentially, from the brink of defeat. Have to give a lot of credit to Tenor in the back line, especially Alex of Ninjas in Pajamas. This is the pressure right here, cracking Fischeko, his old teammate, out of the sky, making sure he can't take over these fights. You look at Alex having arguably the best performance we have seen in this tournament today. I mean, 24-9 on the Mave, it's arguably his best character of the tournament thus far. Yeah. I want to look forward a little bit to Vex. Look at what he's done on the aisle. Look at what he's done on the Grover. The only stat that doesn't really fall off as you get to the later of the stages of the game is that damage reduction that Io provides. And he just single-handedly saved Io's reputation. I know. She has not <laughs> lost while she's been here on the big stage. And they were, what, 10 feet, if even, yeah. away from having that kind of get marred. Now keeping it true, I'm sure Kevin somewhere, wherever he is, is super happy to see her doing incredibly well now. But, I mean, she has been consistent and, and almost frighteningly consistent with the way things have been going for her. And a lot of what she brings to the back, it's a lot of micromanaging, but Vex had it locked down. And that's the thing that makes him so scary. As a support, he's got a good champion or three for every single map. It was so funny. In these final moments of Frog Isle, you could see Fischeko in the Fae Flight absolutely brutalizing the payload, right? Making sure all the defense is cleared off of it. He's under a lot of pressure, though, and it's just Vex from the back line, just lifeline pocketing this man, giving him the damage reduction, giving him what healing was left over, right? This is a very late game Frog Isle. There's cauterized threes online. Only about 10% of that healing is actually making it through to its target, but it's the damage reduction that keeps Fischeko going, allows him to carry the game, and make sure that, you know, they can't quite run away with it. And they keep it tied up here at 2-2. Shattered Desert, though, falls, I think, in that category of NIP, right? I mean, we were talking earlier, right. the same thing you see with Bazaar. It's one of those kind of weirder maps in the Definitely. fact that it's newer. It's something you have to play differently. It's something you have to approach with a different strategy in mind. And Shattered Desert is all fight all the time. It's just three lanes, kind of, of fighting. There's a lot of little nooks and crannies for flanks to go through. I assume Alex is going to feel just right at home here. But it does open up some good questions about Maeve and Eevee for Fischeko as well. That was a huge comeback for Virtus Pro. Let's yeah. call it what it was. Now NIP need to be able to show that they can bounce back. If they were going into this final, potentially final game at a 3-1, I mean, that would have been an incredible way for them to kick it off here. But now they have to bounce back, right? They have to shrug off what was the hardest loss of the set easily, right? To be up so, so much and to have it all just slowly slip away. When I'm looking at Shattered Desert, I'm looking at it as a bit of a weirder map, right? A little bit more niche. That's what NIP has been doing all day today. What they haven't really been doing, Gore, is spicing up the giraffe so yeah. much, right? I think it might be time for that, like, triple tank Tyra or something. Something something inside me is telling me this one's going to get a little weird. I've been surprised we haven't seen as much triple tank today, and that's one of the things, again, it hasn't necessarily been big. It's not overwhelming, but you usually, especially in a best of seven, you get it once in a set, so it's going to be intriguing, I guess, to see if NIP change things up or if they keep going the same path. I would not mind maybe seeing a, a triple tank come through. If they can get a Makoa, that's even better for them. And then pop Alex or Bittner, whichever one you want, onto the Tyra. Probably Alex get Bittner on Barrack. He has such a high win rate on it that I think everything is going to go well for them. Yeah. But it does, it, it's kind of the ebb and flow of this map, right? Do you want to survive as much as you want or, or do you want to fight? Where do you want to go with it? Do you want the flanks or do you want something that's going to be Super tanky. This map, man, it's, it's it push relatively and pull. new. It had a very kind of polarizing release, right? People yeah. either loved it or hated it. 
It was very different in the fact that you saw a lot of just heavy five-man flanks. The teams kind of had to rotate and stick together, lest they be caught out in the open and slain. We're into the draft now for game number five between Ninjas in Pajamas and Virtus Pro, the second semifinal of the day. We've already played our first one. First team punching their tickets to the finals was the Pittsburgh Knights. Cus Cutie leading the charge with that squad now. Still needing to elect one other team to meet them. To finally crown a champion tomorrow on Championship Sunday here. Bands being pretty standard so far. Both power tanks and both power back lines band away. We've got ourselves set, set up nicely, I think, for maybe one of those triple tank drafts. This is one of those maps, though, in my eyes, where Strix, you can take him or leave him. I feel like a lot of teams would pick him up. He's an insta-pick if he does come through. But you could handle him, I think, a little bit easier than you could handle on sure. other maps. This is one where Maeve and Eevee tend to take precedent, in my mind, because of how much they can impact the game. Whichever one you're going to feel more comfortable on, you want. Honestly, if you can get both, it's worth it. This is a good map for double flank, just like it can be a good map for triple tank. Either way is going to work out for them. And it looks like Virtus Pro would have just as much interest in Maeve as they should. Yeah. It's clean. It did well for him earlier in the set. There's no reason to avoid it. Typically when a 24 and 9 type of performance comes out, you Welcome either ban it or you Please get it away from away. that man. I think not only is this a good pick for Virtus Pro in terms of arrays being able to perform on the champion, but you have got to make Alex switch it up. You cannot allow him to have another type of game like that. I, it was a miracle that they were able to survive the way they did against that performance on Frog Isle. And good on Alex for stepping up, right? There's a lot of talks. There's a lot of big names in this set. This guy, last year, wasn't even qualifying for Lance for right? Yeah. Now he's sitting here poised to go to the finals of the World Championship. I mean, what about it? What a turnaround for his career. I uh, know, that's one of the things we were kind of touching on earlier. I just think it's so funny to see Bees and Alex technically on a team here in the finals yeah. after such a... Well, what, I, I can't call it anything but abysmal run on Mal Sports last year. Bees coming in as the coach, actually helping pull together an IP towards the end of phase two, but Alex has been that crucial like key all year. Between him and Bittner, it's just been so versatile. They Not every team has someone who can play five to six to seven to eight different champions, let alone play them back to back in a set every single map. I mean, one of the things that I remember most about Alex was one day where they came in, they 4 0'd, I believe it was Navi or somebody in the first phase, and he played Barrick into Eevee, into Cassie early yeah. on, into Drogas. Like it was four distinct play styles across four maps, and every single one of those, he was like 20 and 8. He just did not care what he was doing. Let's not get it twisted. I mean, even though that Mouse Sports team was near winless, he's still a solid player, oh, yes. right? NIP still had you the vision to be able to pick this guy up. Stranger. And I think because of those, we'll call it humble beginnings for Alex, he has that drive in him, right? He has the desire to succeed, to paint himself in a new light. Some newer faces popping up here in the draft. A lot of ruckus in the first set. This will be the first time that we see him here in the NIP VP set. Played a big role in Pittsburgh Knights versus Envious. What do you think it's going to be able to do here on Shattered Desert for NIP? I mean, here they're looking to round it out. They need to support when it comes down to it. But with, what, Khan Ruckus? You want another tank. I honestly wouldn't be too upset if they could grab maybe a Fernando, something to stand on the point. You have Ash to contest Barrick, an Io, and an Anara. Virtus Pro are so focused on the objective that you're either going to go all in on damage and look for maybe a Genos with something to, to do a little damage on the side, and Eevee fits perfectly, or you're going to look for a tank and then something that can keep them sustained. I kind of like the idea they're going for. I think it plays Shattered Desert a lot better. It's all aggression. It is all about winning the fight. And when it comes to this map, that can shake things up perfectly. And I'd be used to needing to lock in their final two selections here. So nice they locked it twice there. <laughs> we'll get that sorted out. They were hovering. Um, obviously a support champion there, still needing one of those. Genos was what they were toying around with. I think that would complement an Eevee nicely, and it was, in fact, the Genos locked in there for NIP. So being able to spread the love, spread the damage amplification as well. NIP are not looking to win this through sustain. Yeah, they are very shaky on point control. Khan is the only one who can really get in there to contest it and be consistent with it. 
but at the same time, you've got so much kill potential on your team that you might not care too much. You get Bulldozer late game, Io, Luna, they stop mattering. If you can get some Cauterizes, a little bit of Wrecker, you're going to be able to deal with the Barrack Shield and the Inara Health. It shuts them all down. But I just listed three items that you're going to need to make sure you get every single point tank yeah. here. You're going to have to wait and hope the economy goes your way. You kind of want this game to go long to help you out. Final pick locked in for Virtus Pro. All hail the Bomb King. Fischeko and the Bears trying to take the lead. Are indeed sounding, my friends. The Bomb King is here, and that's not something. Now, here's the reason why this is interesting: is because it's not something we typically see on Shadow Desert Crescent. This is not a normal character pick. But I think it kind of has to do with the fact that they want to lock areas down, right? And Nara Barrett, not the most mobile necessary combination of tanks. They're going to try to zone out NIP, and if you're going to try to find the opening, Khan Ruckus. Ruckus can get a little aggressive, but Khan has to waddle. His commander's grab is not really getting him much of anywhere, and we can see the early start. Prensi locking down the tunnel side. We're actually kind of ignoring the right, but it looks like that might be the, uh, the Mave's job. Yeah, it might end up being the case. I mean, but Mave has to back out, though, to use those daggers and the pounce to disengage. Arrays trying to find the damage. However, there's going to be another pause. Arrays has to back up, though, and it seems like the fight was sort of shifting towards the red team right there. I mean, it was looking really, really good at first, but still, I mean, it is anybody's game. The game really just, just has just started. Yeah, that Mave Ruckus duel, definitely good for Arrays to, to just back away, give it up. Mave Ruckus, it's not a 1v1 you want to take, not because one person will win it or not, but because whoever's losing is just going to leave. Right. If the Ruckus is losing, you'll probably go down. As a Ruckus, the Mave is just going to leave. You're not going to be able to chase them down not going to be able to find those kills. Combination of high mobility and the damage reduction in the Mave builds that most of these players run. All these custom loadouts tuned over the years of playing this game. Mave has multiple damage reduction cards. One after pounce, one after being low HP. That's pretty much in everybody's build across the board when you're playing her. And that's kind of why she's rose to prominence. Not just the fact that she has incredible damage at range, good poke damage, 800 if you connect both daggers, but the survivability on a character that can, that can burst you down, more or yeah. less, if every shot hits. Yeah, and I mean, you have to be careful about that. On top of that, I mean, we brought it up during the normal season about how, literally, what are you going to do against a maid? Her job is literally to rotate around. We were specifically talking about it on Bright Marsh, the effectiveness, effectiveness it has there. But just Maeve in general, you've got the Midnight, but what are you going to do when Maeve hits you? Like, are you going to try to catch her? Like, no. Like, what, you can't catch up to her. Unless she extends in the wrong way, right? If she right. puts herself in a position that makes it easier to catch out, then yeah, but a Maeve being played perfectly is going to be very hard to overcome, and that's why it's, it's so prominent in this pro league. These are the players who aren't making those missteps. We've seen last set, Simsalu literally just floating floating outside of the map, yep. more or less, untouchable, avoiding a ton of damage there. And it, it just shows the amount of flexibility you have when you have that level of mobility. Yeah, I mean, that is 100% true. I mean, once again, though, you have the Maeve there, and you have the pressure it is that she can apply just from rotations alone, just from the presence that she has, the daggers as well. What do you do in this situation if you're going up against that Maeve? How do you try and counteract that? Of course, there are some characters that can counter it. Leon being one of those picks for sure. You have two auto-aim abilities, and she just got that burst damage, dude. What do you do about a Maeve in this case, though? Look at me gets a little better. I think it's going to be tough to play against VP's composition in, in general. They're going to have to find a way to surround. They're going to not let themselves get walled off, because that's what VP wants to do. They want to slow you down, slow the game down, get objective time. When you have two point tanks and an IO, you're, you're, you're focusing on the point. Right, right. That is definitely your priority. And uh, that's how VP have been playing, I think, at the start. And up here doing an all right job so far. We're still very early into the fight, of course. But finding that opening already, you forced the Maeve away. You're going to be able to take that ground in the back right side, chase them down, and just corral them. Make that wall that they place not across the objective. Make it back away. And then if they're stuck there, they're not going to be able to bust into you. They don't have that aggressive of a composition. Yeah, and I mean... I'm going to bring this up because we've seen her so many times a day, more than I believe that we've ever seen her in an entire day, let alone almost the entire split, Io. I mean, yeah. you have the Bulldozer to be able to counter that. For those of you who don't know that are here, Bulldozer costs 150 credits. It does a lot of damage to deployables, so on, so forth. And it's able to counteract that Io. Do you get rid of Io then? Why, why let them have it so many times? I, I'm not sure. I think they weren't expecting them to take it because of the double point tank potential here. In fact, they already had it, but seems to be doing well for GP already. 30%, that's what their composition wants to do. 
Chico trying to spam over here, locking them down. And this isn't what NIP want. They don't want to be locked out. This draft is already working wonderfully. 48% to 18, a 30% point difference already. Now they swap targets. The Bonkers in a bad spot. A good wall, and he can't dash through it. They're going to be able to find the pick onto him. 75% for Virtus Pro to a meager 18 from NIP. I love that they pulled it out on this map, too. It's all about rotations and play against them, right? VP said, no. No, we're just going to hold the point. You deal with it. Figure it out. No one's probably done this to you before. Boosted. Cassie, though, on the side, shredding into Crunchy, forcing out the Earth and Guard. Pacheco might actually go down here, too. A great flank by Bonkers. Can open things up. Good rotation to be able to make sure they take out Pacheco and don't allow him to continue his reign of terror on this Bomb King, man. He's been watching both of those sides. Closing areas for anyone to try and walk through. Pops them right up into the air. Fires a good crossbow bolt. You take care of Josephs, and now you're just staggering out the Anara. You're going to be able to kill her as well and force VP to not push forward. This is going to be an impossible retake. Not only is the Anara down, but there's no other real way in. And the overpower on the side to catch the main is going to make it nigh impossible. No way they can bust through this side, and they're going to have to hold, lock things down, and try to move their front line once they get the respawn. And actually, looks like Krusty wasn't noticed mounting in on the side. He might be able to find a pick. Two minutes and 20 seconds remaining because NIP have just captured the first point on Shattered Desert, and now they're able to push the car. Trades here and there on both teams' sides, but you've got about three ultimates up on NIP's side and four up for Virtus Pro. The ultimates used by NIP were to try and get that zone going, but Crunchy is actually going to go down. Two minutes still remaining, and NIP are still steamrolling. So Crunchy mounted behind them to just stand on the cart that whole time. Crunchy just bought 30 seconds, more or less. Soloing, soloing into Bird, just standing in front of Bird. I think his Anara inexperience as an off-tank player kind of showed there a little bit. Nara traditionally left to your main tank, but he walked up to Bird and alone got Void Grip and, and Earthen Guarded to counter that Void Grip. You don't need to do that when you're alone. He burned his resources, and it didn't let him buy as much time as he could have. Right now, though, NIP locking down this payload. Due to the surround coming in through time and space, catches Prenzi on the way out. Nice. Tries to put the wall up, but you had to take account for one more ability to through time and space to finish off Crunchy. They were able to get that, but that's because they want to hold his momentum. They're still pushing forward. Joseph's eating a lot of damage. A good commander's grab pops him up right into the sky, and Alex pops him right out of it to make sure that Joseph goes down, but Pacheco finds that kill on Bonk. Crazy. Rough movement actually getting healed up by the IO. Bursted back up, almost got himself caught out with a pounce into the wall, and Erase finds two. Diggy and Alex go down. Aggressive push now from VP. They want to place that line as forward as possible. Not it being too forward potentially, but do they know Bonkers there? Yeah, no bonkers waiting on the side if they don't see him. It's gonna be bonker back door number two. Oh no, perfectly like fighting a raise, but they're backing up. They know they don't know where he is. They see the master running, they know it's a threat. Bonker now has to show himself. No chance, but still, VP just bonkers positioning on that side completely denied any chance for an aggressive zone. Yep, they couldn't push, push up any further than that. Excuse me, so the cough right there. Pacheco gets overpowered, and they're actually able to get that pick. Bird, however, is going to be able to get that last hit. He's the one that's going to take credit for that kill. But of course, there will be elimination. They'll be able to, they'll be able to take credit for that. Based off of an assist, Crunchy wall up, but still unable to contest. 15 seconds remaining in this round. The NIP are still pushing forward. Crunchy definitely looks a little lost on Anara. Honestly, I think they needed to maybe put him on Barrack. It's traditionally the off tank, but some teams have been making the swap lately. But rounding this corner, what ultimates would be willing to use? They have all five. They could afford to spend one with an overpower gun. They're still holding on to it. They don't want to pull the trigger. They think they can hold it without them. Yeah, they don't want to use it. They want to save it in the next round as well in case they need to bonker all the way up. Such an aggressive zone, but the bodies are piling up in favor of DP, man. Three kills already and forcing their support all the way into the back. A triple for a raise and a successful defense for Virtus Pro, man. Five ultimates up for them. Not a single one used in defense or in offense during that point fight. Great discipline by them, too. Not spending anything, not panicking. 2-2 two, two in the World Championship semifinals. I would, oh, be, man. I would be spending my ultimate as soon as I get it. Right. What if it's bad? Might as well just throw it away, you know? You never know, but... Still, they held on to it. They, you, they knew Fischeko was going to be able to do enough damage to force NIP to be unable to contest. Just constantly spam that one corner, lock it down, and who else is going to clean up on all that damage but the Maeve? So much mobility, so much potential to chase these kills. You can see a race making good on all of that. That's what I'm saying, dude. I mean, like, that's why I was mentioning it before. Five, Maeve does that. Four, what are you going to do to be able to three, catch her? It's a reason two, why Leon is picked one. and counterpicked to her to be able to try and stop that. Get those shots, make sure she 
gets out of this fight. It's so effective when you have that opportunity. But I digress. 1-1 one, one, Virtus Pro NIP. And the first shots are ringing true with point, very little point percentage for NIP. Nothing used yet, but Seismic Crash might open things up. They avoid it. Actually, basically connects on nothing. VPS Ooh. disengage and NIP catch Pacheco. They didn't realize that they were in the back line. They take care of him, but Vex is able to at least get that last direct on a bunker. Now they're pressuring the support. They want to do what they can. They actually use that. And Vex is going to be the one that still goes down despite all of that. 33% for Virtus Pro, man. Two ultimates used, Dome Shield, Seismic Crash, both frontliners ultimate, the Nara Barrett, gone. You have three ultimates remaining, one for the support, two for the DPS, and still three on NIP side. Shiko's trying to help his team out right now. Diggy playing next to the objective, Bunker on the side, they're surrounded by the tanks, that's what NIP has to do. They know the answer to this composition, but how well can they pressure it? Pacheco backing up, now look, all corralled into the corner. Doe might be overextended with this flank from Tenor, barely avoids it at the last second. They actually have to disengage ball, but he couldn't get the big game damage directly onto Baron. There's a talent that she can take, that shreds tank. She hit him with a disengage, knocked him back, marked him, but didn't get the last hit. The overpower goes through. You see a raise being yoinked all the way from the back line, right into the palm of Khan. You have Bittner, Alex, the two of them, not only getting last hits, but finding these kills that they need. 51% to 39. Alex is in the back, directly onto Vex, but he has Sacrificial Link. He has that talent to try and trade off for it, but Buck is still going to get the kill. Bucker does find the kill to chase him in the end, and I thought he was going to ask about Sacrifice when I had another chance. Midnight coming in from VP. Potential maybe to get to the objective. They know a raise has to be somewhere on the side, and looks like he thinks better of it. Knows there's no chance, doesn't want to give them any more ultimates, and NIP captured another objective. And that is crazy that Vex is running Sacrifice. That basically has never been seen, I think, in, in PPL, in PWC at all. That talent, when you die on a 30 second cooldown, you'll trade places with Luna. Right? On the side, it's a little bit too aggressive, and two people die for VP. I would have never thought that double point tank would be just being dominated, just like they are right now. This is so hard for VP to try and fight back against NIP's draft. You've got Cassie, you've got that dive potential, and you have somebody like a general to boost everybody's damage. What can you do against that? He gets popped right up into the sky and then taken out by Diggy. I have a feeling this is a composition they tried in scrims. They're like, this is sick. And then when they went to play it on the stage, who are they playing? NIP, this is the aggressive team. They love to play comps like this, run around you. Of course they're going to be able to find the answer. Alex goes in, doesn't get the ear shot, but pressures Fischeko back. That's healing that's not going to the tanks. And look how low Kruntzi is. Alex Ken is putting on so much anti-healing on a Kruntzi. He cannot be heal at all. Well, really, he can, but it's so minuscule. You would think it's nothing. A minute and 20 seconds still remaining as NIP creep their way ever so closely to the finish line. They get the kill on the arrays, and that's a perfect start. Tough corner to push through, though, especially with Bomb King locking down that top right choke point. NIP needs to move together and land on Pacheco if they want to make this happen. Bunker looks ready. Alex just playing with the wormhole for now, but the flank on the right catches fish. Now they don't need to dive the bomb king. Minute remaining, and they still are getting pick after pick after pick. And a payload pushing in. It is so hard for Virtus Pro to find their opening. Two kills already for Alex. A third one in the form of Diggy. You have two, a double, a single, and now you have another for Bonker with three to one. But let's not get too excited. We saw the same story last time on Frog Isle. I would not count Bird as pro out. Shout out, though, to uh, VP Bird for holding <laughs> on the objective for another moment. The sixth player really coming in clutch there. Like, I guess seventh with an IO, but still. That was, I think, a really solid push by them. They distracted them so long on the left side that everybody else on NIP just slipped around the right. Yeah. No fall off on some of that damage. They're just chipping, chipping away at Pacheco. IO can't spread heals that well. No damage reduction because of sacrifice. So not able to pocket the team and keep them alive for some of these situations. And, NIP just took great advantage of that. Yeah, they did, but that's what they do, man. I mean, when you give NIP the momentum, when you have that ability to have that aggression with them, it is so, so easy to get tripped up because you're like, all right, cool, we got a chance. It's 1-1. One, one. Okay, now it's 3-1. Like, literally, that's just the pressure that NIP has. That's, that's what the comp kind of allows them to do. So much pressure you can put on here. Right now, the NIP kind of clumped up, but that's not what you want. This King Mob can open things up. Trumpets are coming in. The Hexafire is also being used, but Dodge rolls her way right out. He's coming right back around. But the hex fire was up. He did not get stunned by that. They get rid of Pacheco and a raise. 27%. The comeback mechanic is available for Virtus Pro. With two ultimates still up and ready for them. But still, NIP are not giving them any time or space to do anything. 
And now they're going to stagger Crunchy as well. A little bit of an early kill there by Alex. Hopefully for their sake, that doesn't bite them as time goes on. Ice block burns as well in a forward positioning right now. Everybody on BP locked on this one side. Alex is going in for the kill. Ice Storm finds it. Bunker, so good with the aggression. With the dismounts, with the damage, with everything. What do you do against NIP that are putting on a tear right now, doing so much damage to everyone? Luna <laughs> Luna chases her through the wall as that last moment Slice for Crash comes in, but it doesn't find anything. Full grip on Don't. I don't think this is going to save nice. it. Nice! NIP still able to catch that victory for themselves. Very, very well done by them. Doing so, so well, man. I mean, they had that aggressive comp. They had the ability to be able to do that. And what do you do, man? I mean, that's... That's just how the cookie crumbles. They did exactly what I said, right? Yes, it was an aggressive composition, but they didn't just go in. They didn't just feed into them. They played it slow. They just wanted to push them back, weather them out with the damage boost that they have, and they had to just play that advantage. They did it perfectly. They had the response, and VP need to have a response to be able to keep themselves in this set because they looked figured out. Yeah, they did, man. I mean, literally, what do you do against that? I mean, I know I said that already before, but just take a look at that. They're having a huddle right now. Virtus Pro, they are struggling. That is no understatement. NIP are looking phenomenal. Three to two already in this set, but still it's up in the air. I don't know who's gonna take it. And that's how all these sets are probably gonna go this entire world oh, championship. Shout out to Bonker, I gotta say, on Ruckus. Mm -hmm. Not something, he plays it, but he hasn't had a great performance. That was great following up on everyone's damage by him. I agree with that already. Pittsburgh Knights versus NIP. NIP take their third game. Will they close out the set? Find out after this break. When missions call for a team that exercises diplomacy or keeping a cool head, a light touch or restraint, you should call a different team. Because that is not what we do. It's the opposite, in fact. You guys ready? Now you're just showing off. A little bit of Roko action for you there, but we still have something to settle here on the main stage. The semifinals of the Paladins World Championship coming at you. Ninjas in pajamas take the lead and move themselves to set point with a 3-2 lead over Virtus Pro. Gormizer, real quick, let's reflect on Frog Isle again. If NIP could have just closed out there, man, this yeah. set potentially could have been over. And that's maybe a crushing moment for them, but I think it's more important they show resilience afterward, yeah. right? You get what I would argue is a very crushing defeat at the hands of Virtus Pro, but then you bounce back with it in a pretty clean manner. I mean, it's, again, not necessarily crazy slash lines compared to some of what we've seen today, but yeah. at the same time, it's exactly what you need. It's enough control to be able to find yourself a win pretty solidly and kind of right out from under the nose of Virtus Pro towards yeah. the end there. Not a landslide victory, but solid, I think, yeah. across the board from NIP. You look at a lot of those slash lines, very good stuff, all the way down to the support even, right? Bird's four and one. He's fragging out. He's having the time of his life. Alex showing signs of life on not Maeve, right? Having yeah. not one, but two characters. Virtus Pro need to be sorely worried about at this stage. Tetner's already showed us an electric performance on the Cassie, hitting a lot of big shots in a lot of big moments, as well as somewhat of a quiet performance on the Bomb King from Fishy. And that really does hit, I think, harder home for Virtus Pro, where it's just, you kind of go all in on the Bomb King here, like Maeve needs to go well, but you really need Bomb King to show up and just blow them out of the water. And he didn't. That's kind of where it fell apart. There were a couple of cool moments where you do see the King Bomb come through and look like it's going to set something up, and look like it's going to set something up, and then it just, it it just kind of gets there, it keeps rolling, it keeps rolling. Tough, man. And then you see Fish Echo kind of reluctantly, maybe even at the end of the timer, detonate and then have to kind of walk away without any kills. 
Wicked consistent on the EV here was Alex. Have to shout out Diggy Dog as well. Bonker on the Ruckus, bringing out a lot of different flavor, right, to keep yeah. this set interesting, to keep VP on their toes. We saw a lot of Ruckus in the first set of the day. This is the first time we got to see it, and it's not a super common pick for Bonker either. So for him to have the type of performance that he did, again, bodes very well for Ninjas in Pajamas for the rest of this set and potentially a world grand final if they can close out one more match. And it's such a weird thing to think of, but one of the best strings that NIP has had all year is their flexibility. And originally it was, yeah, Bittner and Alex can play anything. Bird can play any support. That's usually all you needed. You've got Diggy to play pretty much either triple uh, yeah. flank. If he wants to, he can go for TPS. He can do tank. He's going to be aggressive with that as well. Sure. But now you've got Bonker flexing onto things as well. Like, you've got four guys, five guys, honestly, that can play pretty much whatever they want down there. It makes it really hard to draft against. Let's talk a little bit about Diggy Dog and his flexibility and the role that he's played for Ninjas in Pajamas throughout this year. This was the guy that was the import player before it was cool, right? He yeah. was on the rock star Australian team, Kanga Esports. He makes the jump all the way from Australia, moves in with Bird in Sweden so he can play in the PPL back when it was only North America and Europe that were participating. That was a huge move for his career because he showed that he had the chops to cut it at the next level, not only the next level, but arguably at the time, the European region yeah. being the stronger of the two. And he, it was weird to think of because originally he didn't necessarily have that big of shoes to fill, right? But since he came in as the sub for that period yeah. between times, the Knights right now are probably thanking them for not picking him up and yeah. kind of letting him stay free agent for that because now we see how big that's been. I mean, twice he's made it to the finals for each land he's been to this year. Simpson has so got one hell of a story him, yeah. I mean, a redemption arc nearly <laughs> complete. If he can grab the ring, he's already punched his ticket to the world's finals tomorrow. 10 a.m. Sunday is when that's going to kick off here, but we still have a score to settle. Two to three, heading into game six on Timber Mill. Virtus Pro's map selection. Again, loser's pick. Whoever loses the previous map chooses the next. Virtus Pro will have first selection of Timber Mill. We saw Timber Mill in the PK Envy set earlier. The bands were, of course, the snipers. Yeah. A little bit of tank play around there as well. Some very high priorities on things like the Willows, the Leons, those counters, and those uh, power picks. Unlike earlier, though, we're not going to be seeing any of the power tanks come through. This is one of those maps, as you had actually mentioned with Kresnik, the tanks don't matter as much. They do no. still have a huge impact, but you're in kind of a fishbowl. You're at the bottom of a fishbowl if you're at the front line and having to stand on the objective. It's very difficult to maneuver. You can't feel as impactful unless you happen to catch them on one of the side buildings. But the snipers, hands down, one of the best things. I still think Cassie, Leon are probably going to be very high priority here. You might see some shakeup, but I feel like most of these teams know what they want. I expect Eevee, I expect yeah. Maeve to come through as well. At this stage, I, I sure hope you do know what you want. And first pick now ready to be locked in. Both of the snipers again sat out. The front lines, you've been seeing it all day long. Interesting priorities here and there. And Ninjas in Pajamas, when going second, have now done this twice, where they ban the Inara. It's not a throwaway ban, Gormizer, but I think the intent here is to keep a lot of things open for them as the second pick. Not only that, but it locks down Dosip. Dosip loves playing Inara. He does really well on Inara as well, and that's incredible. one of the big factors that has led to success for Virtus Pro, not only today, but in the past. It's been a huge champion for them. And I think the willingness to let Atlas, let Willow through and play around them instead of kind of be scared of them, be like, you know what, we know what we need to ban. We need to get rid of something specific to you just to make sure that we can kind of control this. You're one map away from victory. That's a play that you have to make. Pacheco back on the Willow, it would seem as it is locked in first for Virtus Pro. This is a character he can hyper carry the game. Look what happened on Frog Isle. He is one of the most infamous bomb kings in the scene, but I just don't know that the king is really in a position to hyper carry the game and be the superstar fragger that we know Fisheko can and has been in the past. It's comforting to see him back there for Virtus Pro. Looks like Ninjas and Pajamas will still hover and prioritize their front lines first. And this is one of the big champions that worked for him earlier. I think it's a good stabilization when it comes down to it. Willow, if you're already having trouble standing on the objective as a frontline because you're in the bottom of a fishbowl and everybody's looking at you from the top, shooting down into you, you're gonna have a much worse time 
now that you're dead zoned on said objective. Like, you can't even do the one thing you are trying to accomplish in the game. You have to take a different path, you have to go for a flank. With Barrack and Khan, you can accomplish that if you're an IP, but you are maybe a little timid about it, especially if you're Barrack. Like, do you want to leave the objective for too long? Yeah. Depending on what Virtus Pro go up with. And they aren't too shy to pull out an IO. For sure. Could still give them a lot of control around the objective. Might make it difficult for an IP to make those calls. For sure. We saw Khan be extremely impactful for Rubu. Undying through two rounds. He had an electric performance. So again, if you're an NIP fan, comforting to see Diggy Dog, where he will be likely well at home. Atlas is still alive and well in this draft. Not only does it make it through the ban phase, but he will be picked up in the third phase of picks. Very, very rare to see this character in particular survive this long. And I wouldn't say, you know, it's Timber Mill. Front lines aren't necessarily the highest priority on this map like we were talking about, but Atlas is still extremely good because of that weapon. It's one of those things, a long range hit scan, it's gonna do 900 damage, it has a unique fire in it. What doesn't and if you can get that long precision shot, running. yeah, it takes a little bit of time to charge, but if you get a headshot, it's 1300 damage. Yeah. You're going to chunk Big out scale. most people. If they do go for an Eevee, she's at 500 health after that. She has nothing left to do. So you kind of keep them under control. Even Maeve will feel the power of that shot. But I think it's more impressive to think NIP have twice let that through and twice thought maybe we can handle this. I wonder if that's going to be like a, a downfall. I mean, that seems almost like a fatal flaw to let such a strong champion right. through. Well, we're winding down here. The last two picks about to be locked in for Virtus Pro. They will claim the Cassie as their own. And they will hover the Ash, likely to lock that one in as well. Only one pick remains for NIP. It's starting to get a little bit real here, folks. We're headed into game six. Virtus Pro is up against the ropes. They have no more maps to give. Just one map stands between NIP and the grand finals. It would be Tenor's first. It would be Diggy Dog's first final. Like I said, Alex wasn't even qualifying for lands a year ago, and now he stands one map between him and the grand finals. Bird and Bonker have been there before. They know what it is to win. I'm looking to them to anchor this team and to get it home, get them to Sunday. Go and this ahead. is the only time Keep tanks become a can. crucial issue on Timber yeah. Mill. There's three of them you have to burn down now. You have struggles maybe dealing with the Barrack, but Khan Last and Ruckus, fight, they can man. control both sides. It causes a lot of issues for Willow. It makes Cassie have to play back. You can't get as aggressive if you want to if you're Virtus Bro here. And now not only are you locked away because of the tanks, you've got a Maeve chasing you down. It's interesting though. I mean, picking three tanks into a big game Cassie, into a Maeve, or a Willow, excuse me, when you have no hit scan to pressure that out, it's, it's a little nerve wracking for me. I can't imagine picking Ruckus into Cassie on a normal game, but going into it, knowing know it's going to be a big willingly. game and you have three tanks yeah. on your team. <laughs> it's definitely a dangerous game that they're playing with. And again, I think it's kind of an overwhelmed strategy. I feel like if they can keep her isolated and locked down because of Maeve, then the tanks are kind of free to roam. If we see just anything that resembles what Rubu did on this map with Connor this morning, then I think NIP are pretty clean cut. Inarguably the spiciest draft of the day, potentially for the final time. Let's get in the game. Let's get in the game indeed. Like Nick was saying, one game away for NIP to qualify. Well, not really even qualify at this point. Make it to finals. Yeah. It'll be some of their team's first finals that they've been to. Yeah, and that'd be impressive for them. Crazy. I, I, I love that they've gone with this draft. They're definitely not afraid to take risks. and. Yeah, you look at this and you say, Triple Tank, that's not risky. It wins a ton of games, but it's Timber Mill. Right. It's against Cassie and Willow. Even the Temporal Divine to split the team. That's kind of a big deal, but they're going to have to play around that. See how NIP could do it. They are a team that has been practicing this Triple Tank a lot. They, I, they're out of all the teams in practice and matches. They are definitely not afraid to bring it out. I want to see how that proficiency helps them here. It will indeed. Let us see how it's going to help them. Just like you were saying, Kresnik, 5% for NIP already. Pyre Strike goes out. And because of that, they delete this man. They Thanos snap him out of existence. And Bender's low too already because of that. 9% for NIP, but the control is to VP. You can see Bunker though. I don't know if they know he's here. In a good position to dive the back line if Vex isn't ready, but he shows early. Maybe not enough patience, maybe they're worried, but not a lot of cap time yet. He had all the time in the world, and now giving himself away. The world of I had used, but now it's gone. The stage is set for NAP to pressure Ooh. and get in here, but Alex immediately forced out. They do not want to go down in this game right now, but Cruncy 
gonna be the first one to die in this little exchange right here. 24% to 30, Pacheco looking extremely low. Flutters directly up. Hard to hit those air shots directly onto that Willow. And actually gets disengaged right off the top of it. Scout gets used as well. 57% for NIP. Still zero to zero, and no one has captured the point. Scout means nothing tricky though. NIP can't play up on the flank here. Bonker though, I guess even with Scout, that information wasn't enough. Bonker finds a raise, and Dome might be caught out here trying to lock them down. Yeah, and for the Pacheco though, he's coming right back around, drops that dead zone, and now just free firing at so many targets. Okay, the Dread Server gets used to try and peel for his team, but Pacheco does not kill anyone, and they're still alive. Cruncy is still there, but he's gonna go down. 72% for NIP. I cannot believe they got away with that. Pacheco shot a Mave that was jumping the whole time, so he wasn't able to splash the ground and find it. Diggy overpowers onto Fish to deny that pressure, and NIP off the back of Pacheco just wanting to get one kill on Alex. Turn that around, and they're 1-0 on what could be the, the set map for them. Yep. I mean, what? You have to... You have to find something. You have to find something to be able to do anything. The good dismount from Bonker, the inflame, so that way they can try and get something started for themselves. But look at where they are. They're low health. Bird is going to be taken now. They no longer have any healing, but the car's still moving. It has not stopped. And Bird is pro. They have to find an answer for it, and they're trying their best. They're moving in, firing shots all which way, but all the guns are out! And he focuses down Vex. The Hexafire is going to get rid of Furia. They don't have any healing on Virtus Pro's side either. Good disengage. The big game is there. They're caught in the 1v1 as well. A raise as the dodge roll his way out. Joseph tries to follow up and find that opportunity, but he's going to have to back up too. NIP are not giving any ground. Bunker shouldn't be alive. No one on BP went to go help them find the kill. A raise couldn't finish it off. Oh, Tenor man. chases down a raise, and this cart's gonna keep moving. Bonker keeping control of it. Very aggressive by DG2 up front with the con trying to chase down Vex, not let him get away. Still pretty healthy because of this range, but if they move in, they collapse. This could be a massive stagger. A minute and 15 seconds still remaining with NIP not giving any quarter to Furtis Pro. They have not stopped their push. They have not stopped their aggression either. They want this. They know that they can end up winning this, and they want to be able to do that. The divider goes out just to counter anyone who's trying to push in. Pacheco uses that fake fight. He's high up in the sky, raining hellfire down on Bittner, but he is still alive despite all that. So chasing down the two tanks on the side. They're trying to ignore the Fae flight. I thought Fish was going to fly over the edge there, but they do trade with Diggy. Bunker also follows off Vex, cleaning up two kills, but it's a 3v3, and this Dread Serpent could help NIP. It could, but the Assert Dominus has to be used. Slithers right out of there, does not want to get stunned in this very, very last few seconds. 35 seconds, and they're all grouping up. They got rid of Vex. They don't have any healing. There's the rewind. Going to set them down to his lowest health, but a good stun, a good snake bite. A raise is not giving up hope. He got rid of Bittner, and it's forcing the rest of NIP back with 20 seconds left. They have to find a way to capture this point or they're gonna be tied with Virtus Pro. But if Alex can get away, they have a chance. They have their spawn still coming and a couple ultimates if they want to use the Midnight Dome Shield coming up very, very soon. No Dread Serpent for that. That would be a good way to CC, but D oh, Diggy wants this overpower. They need to put Tenor on the point so they can find this. Divide coming out maybe a little early. Wait for them to be on the point, split them up. Diggy has to disengage, but this is all right for NIP. Dose so low in the back. He's going up on top on right directly on the crunch. See that second chance. It's gonna give him more and more life, but he overpowers him, just waits for him. Not gonna let him do anything. Pacheco, Vex, Crunzi, all go down, and NIP with a 2-0 lead against Furnace Pro to go to Grand Finals. What a start here for them with this triple tank composition. People were definitely, I, I was concerned about how it could work, but again, I said it's NIP. They know how to play triple tank. Bittner, this backline DPS just going to barrack. Nobody else is doing something like that, but they are innovators for sure with this composition even into this counterplay they know what to do and honestly i feel like vp don't know their response right. i saw some some strange use of that like i said that divide you know that triple tank's gonna go into you split their team with it they used it early just to get a moment's respite from the pressure but it didn't matter they just walked straight through it they're three tanks you have to find something with it instead of just buying time you mentioned it before you said that during the huddle that VP looked like they were figured out. And NIP, based off of how they're playing, man, I I typically would, I guess, would not agree with that statement because it can still go up to anybody. 
but this is definitely a deciding moment. This could be so much for NIP. Already up 2-0 and point percentages there. They're trying to use that to try and get something on a Diggy. They want to get rid of this con. But Alex moving around. The exile goes out. He's just free firing. And he manages to land the hit. The inflame as well. They're trying to fight back. The battle shot to give us some immunity. But he's locked in the corner. The shield goes down. But they trade one for one. He'll let themselves get clumped up. A race does find two. Second chance comes out. Still advantage to VP here. But Fish Echo might go down oh. during this free flight. Potentially in the back. Finds Bird. Cannot connect those last shots. Tenor will die on the point with double comeback. I'm not sure if VP or NIP, excuse me, have a chance to make it back towards this objective. But look at these spawners. Because they died on the point, because this fight went so long, they have a chance to get the retouch. They do. They have to find the retouch, though. Especially with the controllers they have. But the clock strikes midnight. You hear that? And Crunchy goes down. I don't know where he was to end up getting picked off. But this is not looking good for Furtis Pro. The shots are being fired directly at Diggy. This triple front line composition is looking absolutely clean right now. Bunker wants a piece. He's in the back line firing shots. They get rid of a raise as well. 54% for NIP, and they still want to be able to win this. Finally, though, the divide does what it needs to do. It splits the team in half on the aggression, and that's how VP turned it around. An inflame coming in from Vex to help them turn this, but at this point, this fight should be theirs. Tenor going, nice. they just want to dive Vex, but they just can't get it. They did it. Virtus Pro able to fight back and get themselves a chance to capture this point. They have comeback mechanic, like Kreslik was saying earlier. 4% every tick and an objective capture for Virtus Pro. They do not want to go down 4-2 against NIP. Like I said, that was what they had to do. You have to find more value out of Atlas's cooldowns. They're so long. Temporal Divide, with that talent, it's 21 seconds every time you get that shield. Normal for a MOBA, but this is Paladin. Ooh. This is an FPS. You're not used to that. Kruntzi gets executed by the Street Justice. Needs to figure out the health pool. He has it. Doe's going to follow suit, and NIP managed to stabilize. Alex with a double kill. Nice job from him. Being able to open up the door for his teammates to walk right on through and put this zone on Umbertus Pro. All they've got is the Faith Flight. They're building up the Exile. That inflame will be up real, real soon, I'm sure. But a good pressure and good rotation. Fire strike straight to the wall, but it doesn't matter. Random little beam, just a, a little bit of damage. Pad Vex's stats, maybe just a little bit of raise. Goes down to the fire from the dome shield, and Crunzy might be following right after Alex. This straight just is getting them so much. And NIP just don't want to give up the zone. Bittner, Alex, the two of them, I mean, they have been, I feel like I've said Bittner and Alex more than anything during this entire set, man. They want to make it to grand finals. They want to keep putting on this pressure. A raise ends up going down. Well, he ends up getting the kill on the bunker. That's going to be the opening. That's going to be extremely good for them. Joseph tries to charge out, but he just gets body blocked. He cannot go through them. And because of that, they're able to get that kill. A rampage for Alex. A double kill as well. They want to keep this pressure going. With a minute left, they can end themselves at a 3-1. I love this little meta break from NIP too. Not just the triple tank, but this street, the street justice. justice. Yeah. Street Justice was played forever, and then everyone kind of picked up Cat Burglar, let them be a little flexible. But guys, nothing changed for Street Justice. It's still good. Dying immediately when you don't know that threshold is, is insanely impactful. And Alex is abusing that so much against them. No one plays against it. So you're not going to be used to how healthy you have to be. You have to use your cooldowns completely differently as a tank to not just get melted by it. Oh, he gets body blocked again. The tire strike by Alex is right around the corner. You heard the announcer say it. Seven in a row for Alex. A seven kill streak already for him. They want to capture this. They want to defend, I should say. But Crunchy in the back just free firing right at Bird. There's nothing he can really do. He can't really back up or go anything. And now, look at this, dude. Ten seconds. VP are now able to push. After all of that, after that point fight, after that point capture, they're still able to get it. And this is one of the hardest compositions to convert a payload against because they have three tanks constantly cycling off the payload. And that's only if they can make it all the way to the final capture point for that payload. They have to get through all this high ground advantage first. Looks like they're getting off the car for now, leaving Crunzy on. But once this temporal divide goes away, he's going to be very weak. Vex is actually taking care of Alex with another. The Street Justice is so hard to counter. Use the teleporter, goes straight up. Now they're looking at Dosups. Now they're putting on this pressure. They see that he's there as well. Body block, one kill apiece. Diggy, Alex, the two of them. 3-1 for NIP. And all 10 ultimates are in the game for what could be NIP's final round.
to go to grand finals. Not if VP has anything to say about it for sure so far, but they have to, again, NIP has to kind of misstep for VP to be able to pull it off, right? They have to put that divide between them when they get overly aggressive. Cruncy has to be ready for it. He can't kind of thirst for a kill. And that's been Cruncy's MO since we've seen him play. I mean, think about his first PPL game back. Those of you who didn't see it, he played Androxus, a champion we don't see very much. He dashed three times in a straight line at a sniper scope. That's just the kind of player that Cruncy is, and he has to control himself so much if he wants to make this work. And look at those slash lines. Alex was 18 and 4. So dominant on this Mave. This has been a prominent pick for so long. And even with another talent that we're not used to seeing, it's still having this much of an impact. Like you said, 18 and 4, and Cruzzy looking real, real low. Of course, using the fighter, didn't even get the chance to use a second chance. The street judge is just going to be able to execute that, that, that frontliner, dude. I mean, 21%. For NIP already. Dome Shield gets dropped directly on point just to make sure no one else can stay. But where you're going, the overpower comes through directly on the Vex. He's gonna be used immediately. In play comes out, but still the kill directly onto them. Who will be able to touch on VP's side to find their opening? The, the, the Hives are fired to start the fave flight. Pushes Fisher to go back. He has to cancel it. Doe's on point. He has to start dominant, so they still have a chance here. But he has to let himself use it. Nice. Doesn't get it off in time, but Tenor's just going to walk away. He's just going to walk away. Or is he? If Fischeko is able to clean up that kill like he did. Now we're looking at a very, very good fight. A dub over Fischeko. The Willow is able to pick him off. And now we are looking at an absolutely phenomenal set right now, folks. The comeback mechanic is still available for VP. No ultimates up. 63%. Two ultimates up for NIP. And I mean, it, it's, it, it still could go either way. The comeback mechanic's there. Great aggression by Diggy in the back to pull them away. Alex, it looks like they actually managed to get OT at that last moment, but Tenor uses the shield off the point. Now he has to touch with nothing, and I don't think the Strength Serpent's gonna be enough. It's not, it's just gonna be able to make sure that our Ruckus can live for a little bit longer. The healing goes out, no one's on point. They're looking for those kills to make sure they can cap it, and they do. Even Vex drops down, the support is there, and two to three for Vernus Pro. They do not want to give up against NIP in this semi-finals match. Very hard for sure for them to come back from double comeback mechanic. And when you retake on this map, it's such a long trek back to the objective. And when they can get to your high ground that easily using the teleporter, where they're not really in that much danger, you can't really overcome it. it it's a mountain that you have to climb, and they've already had all that pressure. And you have those three tanks, low mobility, no real way to kind of cheese past them and get to it. Maybe Alex, but Maeve's not the quietest character in the world. That reset, you can basically hear it from space. Virtus Pro right now, they want to tie this game up. Yeah, it's going to suck giving up comeback mechanic. It's been helping them a lot so far, but they definitely want to like to stand on and move this forward and potentially try to tie this setup. They got rid of a raise. It's already really good. Their damage dealer's done. And Vex is low in the back. Alex knows that, and he gets the kill, a double kill already for him. But still, they are not giving up the fight. They use the second chance to make sure he heals. Because of that, he stays alive. Can I just point out the fear in Cruncy right there? Did you see how early he second chanced? He was like 60% HP. That's the street justice. He doesn't know when that execute threshold is. 35%. Hit with pounce then, that will kill you. But it's so hard to tell that. You have to just know your health pool to such an extent. Erase tries to zone, gets caught out by bonkering. And I appear staring down at potentially another white. They are indeed. I mean, they're, I don't, I'm going to be at a loss for words if this goes to a game seven, man, because they have been fighting back so hard. We counted them out last time. It could be a potential for them to actually end up making this a 3-3 this time. All ultimates are up except for the midnight, but it's coming up soon. Cruncy goes down once again. Willow gets healed right back up. Dex all the way in the back, firing, doing what he can, throws out the pyre to get that stun. But still, NIP are holding ground. They are not giving up. Hard game for Cruncy so far, and it's just so hard to play Atlas into strong backlines, I think. Maeve, no real backline in NIP, but when you can keep your distance, that's what really makes the problem when you can't cross that. Atlas, he only has the speed from his shield to get him forward. Otherwise, his only movement is back. You're going away, and that's not the direction Cruncy likes to go, but apparently the grave is where he wants to go for now. Alex finding him and Fisher go right after. 10 seconds remaining, and you have Virtus Pro dying. One after the other. I don't know if they're gonna be able to make it back. They probably won't be able to. Two to three, like literally what? 26 and what? seven on Alex right now. I just want to point that out. And NIP do get the defense. Again, no point for that. They have to capture the middle point or convert the payload. At this point, to capture the middle point, it's just over, so no payload. NIP have to win a mid-fight if they want to close out Timber Mill and secure their ticket to the World Championship Finals. Yeah, they have to, man. I mean, once again, you said it, two to three, but they are down one. 
So comeback mechanic is still available, right, Kresner? Come back, yeah, single comeback mechanic at this point. It's going to be three, four, three, four for the capture ticks from Virtus Pro for now. And that will, if they manage to cap off that, then it's completely gone. Nullified. Not, both teams will be capturing at about the same rate. And I, I wish I could tell VP what to do about Alex, but I really don't know. He's such a monster right now with this Street Justice. So hard to judge when you can live, especially with with Ash as well, you usually use your battering ram, your shoulder bash with 90% damage reduction. When you're getting low, so you can get out, you can rotate, but you can't get away with that into a Street Justice Mave. She'll just take you out. Damage reduction be damned, you will be melted. Yeah, speaking of melted, Bidner forced to use the dome shield because of the free fire. Actually given by Pacheco. The fighter goes out just to give himself a little bit more time. Bird is already really, really low, but I believe that they actually just dashed straight in. Pacheco was one, another. Josephs, it gets one as well. I mean, this is absolutely phenomenal for VP to be able to do this. They have the scout as well. They're pushing Piggy Dog back, and he uses the battle shot to give himself some immunity, but he's being staggered out. That's all they're doing. And 55% for Virtus Pro. Temporal Divide used that time just to nullify the effectiveness of the Dome Shield. Bonker has to touch stun. stun by Vex. He still gets the overtime, but look how far away everyone else is. Far. Yeah, they can't make it back. The Kinetic Burst are trying to block Bittner, and they do that to a point capture. Stop. Three to three for Virtus Pro. The second time this has happened, this entire set, Virtus Pro are not giving up. And they shouldn't, for sure, with how good they played earlier. We've seen so much back and forth between these teams and VP. They've been so dominant in phase two. Left, came back, maybe struggled, but they looked like they were back to form as we were coming into the end of the season. And they're going to need to stay in that earlier phase two form if they want to take this set. Temporal Divide opens up a little bit of room for them as they take down Bonker. But a couple tanks still remain. So much value out of this triple tank. Nice. Okay, but Alex actually just rotates right back around. Manages to get that kill. The ceilings get thrown out. But Alex is so low, he still goes down. Second chance by Crutzy. Now he's putting on that pressure. The rewind gets shielded, but a good pop from Dosa's all the way from the side to peel for his teammate. They're going to be able to keep that pressure on the Diggy. Bonker tries to move in, but still him and Pacheco. Crunchy and Pacheco are still looking really low. Pacheco gets it. He puts out the divider, gets healed right back up, but they're just going to be able to pretty much keep him in that corner and get that kill. It was a great play by Fish diving onto Bird. Bird's been just free up top, healing everybody this whole time. That's why the healing charts are so skewed in the Maldamba's favor. Three tanks when you're never being pressured. Of course those healing numbers are going to be insane. But Fischeko notices this, sees him just ADing up top, dives on him with the flutter, pushes him out, gets that kill, and it almost turned in their favor, but even with the healer dead, there's a lot of health on NIP. Yeah. Pretty much regardless of anything here. Fischeko thinks he might find an opening. There's a divide up, and the Fae Flight comes out. Yeah, Alex is actually trying to rotate as well. They're just being able to focus right down on the bunker. The shield goes down. They're trying to kill him as much as he can, but he's too high in the sky. There's not really a hit scan to deal with him except for Khan, and he drops right back down and gets the kill on the Alex flutters right back up. Are you kidding me right now? With VP, the dome shield gets dropped. 40 seconds remaining to be able to try and capture this and find themselves at a 3-3. That's a risky dome shield. I guess it bought enough time. They all disengage, but this inflame might make a difference. Bird also solo can't peek, can't heal anybody. You need line of sight to heal with Damba. And that's gonna bite them right now. Tenor so low, barely makes it out up top, but they're gonna chase him down. They get the overpower directly on a dose of, so that's good. They got that kill that they needed. 20 seconds remaining. They can't push up because of the fact that one of their frontliners is gone. They have to wait. They had this overpower, though. So coming in the next round, if they don't push up like that, then they won't have it for the next fight. Yeah, and honestly, if I were VP, I might play really slow here. I don't want to give Barrack ult charge. I don't want to give Khan ult charge. I might want to take my chances on this mid fight. We won the last two, but how much of that was on the back of comeback? Looks like they want to take the fight anyway, but with Pacheco going down, I don't know if it's winnable. Overtime is a factor right now. They're looking to be able to try and close this out, but they're still on the point, giving people time to get their ultimates back up, trying to get what they can. They're still stalling despite all that. Crunch took care of Alex Ray's all the way in the back, tried to use the assert dominance, but gets killed right out of the sky. That it might actually be to his benefit. Birds low all the way in the back, fires, manages to get the kill. Diggy, Bonker, they find themselves one kill apiece. And oh my goodness, if we are going to a game seven, if you are enjoying it, please make some noise. Now, I gotta say, I think, honestly, we could have had a little bit of a turn there if a raise wanted to be a little bit bolder, a little bit more forward. He was holding under, and like I said, they know, they recognize that Bird is just standing up top, but a raise stands still under, ADing a little bit, maybe a little tentative. Then when he finally commits, Bird immediately gets deleted. What if he had done that a couple seconds earlier? What if that healing wasn't in the fight? Right. Could that have been an option for VP? I think he just didn't want to take that risk, and this might be a time you have to take that risk with your tournament life on the line.
Yeah. I mean, this, it all literally comes down to this. They don't have overpower. Two, don't have dome shield, one. but that's building in the works. They've got three ultimates up on NIP side, three ultimates up on VP, almost a fourth one. It could go either way, Chris, like, I don't know. I love this Master Riding 3 on Bonker, too. Some some PPL players told me that Ruckus is a flank when he has Master Riding, and he's useless when he doesn't, so Ooh. getting aggressive is that. And hey, dismounted. Guess it's useless. Bonker goes down to a raise <laughs> right away, and NIP still has some decent control, though. Pacheco uses the fake fight. He's making sure that he's focusing down on Diggy. Now they look at Bender. My goodness, 3% for Virtus Pro. The fight goes out, but he goes down. Diggy battle shouts to keep himself in that room right there, but he is so low. He has to back up, but the Blast damage is too much. They get rid of him. 33% for Virtus Pro. It is not over yet with Bunker at the top. He was waiting with that Hex of Fire, and he gets the kills. They're actually going to find an opening now. Because of that, they can push forward and make sure they do it. But a good exile from Virtus Pro. It was a great fight, Crunchy, to buy time. Binder will have a chance to get to point, though. There's not enough damage from Vex. Dome Shield should go down, but he actually holds off on it. Oh. So much discipline from Tenor, and now they're going to have it for the later fight. Crunchy already up at the top. He's going to be staggered. They're staggering him out. Now they're able to fight back. Now they have the zone 3%. Well, three ultimate, excuse me, for NIP to 93 for the overpower. It is going to come down to the very last fraction of a second. Kresnik, I don't know how this could go at this point. I think there's just too much on NIP side. They're going to Dread Serpent the point. All they have is the Inflame, and here that comes, but look where everyone at NIP is. Central Divide gets them in, but they can't burn that Dome Shield any faster. They use the Dread Serpent. Now they're focusing on Dosefs, but it doesn't matter. The Dome Shield gets dropped on point. Their tank is gone. Overtime is up. They have to fight back, but Murder's broken. 99% to 93, and the NIP are going to capture this point. It's not over yet. I think Pacheco on the right side. They throw a raise in, but now there's no chance. Overpower comes in. A raise goes down with Vex gun. NIP are to going to the Paladins World Championship Grand Finals. To the Grand Finals, NIP go. Some of their first teammates, the first time they've been there. My goodness, what an absolute set. What a banger. Hugs all around. But of course, you got to give credit to BP, man. They were looking so, so good. Absolutely phenomenal right there. They were adapting. They were adapting as the game went on, but NIP answered back. We were all worried about that triple tank, but they managed to pull it out. All these players in NIP, some of them have been there before, some of them haven't. We know Tenor, always the bridesmaid, never the bride, making it that far. But now he's got another shot to make it. He can be in that spot. He can have championship Tenor potentially, but both these teams, history between the players, but shaking hands now in NIP. They are primed to play against the Knights in these grand finals. Absolutely amazing from them, dude. I mean, I have no words whatsoever. All this means is that we're going to a Pittsburgh Knights NIP grand final, dude. Yeah, and it's going to be crazy, honestly, with the way both these teams are looking, for sure. I think it's been kind of back and forth for both of them. I think the sets have mostly been in NIP's favor, but this is a Knights that we are not used to seeing in the past. This is an NIP that is looking insane. Alex, 31 and 12. On the street, Justice Mave. No one else needs any kills on his team. He'll just take all of them. Yeah, they're looking phenomenal, dude. I mean, I've said phenomenal so many times because it only is a testament to how NIP were playing. They were popping off. They were doing what they could, and they were able to capture those points. I am so happy for them. Absolutely phenomenal by them, dude. I'm so proud of them. A lot of damage on the DPSs for VP, but the healing coming in from NIP with triple tank made such a difference. Bird, 250k healing. This basically uncontested up there on the top of the high ground. Well, of course, we have to speak to the winners just like I did, man. Bird and Dolcinaro, stand by. Let's throw it to an interview. Thank you very much, Fon and Kresnik. Down here with Bird, the big winner from Ninjas and Pajamas. Talk to me, man. That is a, a six-game set. Goes down to point seven. What's going through your mind? Talk, talk me through that communication. I mean, it, it was a pretty stressful game and a pretty stressful set, but I felt like we had control most of the time. Like you saw on the Frog Isle, obviously we were up 3-0, and that should definitely have been a conversion. So we felt maybe more in control than it looked. And, and what does it mean to you? I mean, I know a couple of you guys, only two on this uh, roster, have won the whole thing. What does it mean to you, especially for Bonker, to get back a chance to win the world championship tomorrow? I mean, yeah, it, it, it means everything, really. We played for a whole year. I mean, me and Bonker played for, what, four years now just to get this title. So that's, that's really what it means to us, is everything. And, and even more so, three new guys with a chance to grab their first title. Is it as much for them as it is for you two? 
I mean, yeah, Tenor, Tenor liked the look of the, uh, of the ring on Twitter, I think, so that's what he's aiming for. That ring did, uh, did absolutely look great. Uh, talk to me about your opponents tomorrow. I, I think the Knights, I mean, underdogs, really, in their last three matchups. Where's the confidence here? I mean, I know you guys got a lot of video to look back over. What are you guys thinking about your opponents for tomorrow? I mean, I think we kind of lucked out, to be honest, because I feel like NBA Knights play pretty similarly, and they're pretty evenly matched, too. So whatever we practice for NBA, we practice for Knights and vice versa. So I think we're, we're feeling pretty confident going into it. Well, congratulations, man. We'll see you back in action tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, NIP, big winners here in your second semifinal. We're going to send it to a quick break and look at some cosplay.